Uh, good morning and welcome everybody to the second meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2016. Uh, can I remind everybody present to ensure that they have all electronic devices switched off, particularly mobile phones. Um, our next item is to take evidence on two pieces of subordinate legislation as listed on the agenda. And can I welcome to the committee Aileen Campbell, Minister for Children and Young People and our accompanying officials. Um, good morning to you all and a happy new year. Uh, so I think I've seen any of you <laughs> this year yet. Um, after we've taken evidence on the instruments, we will debate the motions in the name of the Minister, items two and three. Officials are not permitted, of course, to contribute to the formal debates. Can I invite the Minister to make some opening remarks on both instruments? Okay, Minister. Thank, thank, thank you, Convener, and good uh, uh, happy new year to you and to the rest of the committee. And thank you for the opportunity to introduce two draft instruments before you today. Firstly, looking at the Secure Accommodation Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016. The amendment regulations make provision about the time limits for and the hearing of evidence in relation to appeals against a chief social work officer's decision to detain a child in secure accommodation, where an order has been made by a sheriff under section 44 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995. Where a child over 12 year years of age is found guilty of certain summary criminal offences, section 44 of the 95 Act allows a sheriff to order that the child be detained in residential accommodation for up to a year. These offences that would be imprisonable had they been committed by someone aged over 21. Importantly, the Section 44 provisions don't extend to indictable offences or to murder. A child subject to a Section 44 order may be placed in secure accommodation, but only if certain conditions are met. The decision to place a child in secure accommodation is taken by the Chief Social Work Officer or of the local authority. Before that decision is taken, the Chief Social Work Officer has to consult with the child, each relevant person and the head of the secure unit. Less than five children were placed in secure accommodation as a result of Section 44 orders in 2013-14, which was the last reported year. When a Section 44 order is made by the Sheriff, there is already an appeal right against the order under the 95 Act. The decision by a Chief Social Work Officer to actually place the child in secure accommodation is also already subject to a review process. However, previously there was no right of appeal against the decision to place the child in secure accommodation in these circumstances. We, along with partners and stakeholders, consider there was an opportunity to improve on that. The substantive issue was addressed by way of Section 91 of the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014. That section inserted a new f Section 44A into the 95 Act to create a right of appeal against the Chief Social Work Officer's decision. These amended amendment regulations supplement those 2014 Act changes by setting out further detail of the procedure relating to such appeals, including timescales, the taking of evidence and the obtaining of the child's views. Alongside the changes already made to court rules and to the 95 Act, this instru instrument will create a process which reflects as closely as possible the appeal arrangements for children placed in secure accommodation via the children's hearing system. Now, turning to the Continuing Care Amendment Order, this amends Article 2 of the Continuing Care Scotland Order 2015, with the effect that from 1st of April this year, the higher age limit for eligible persons specified for the purposes of Section 26A to B of the Children's Scotland Act 95 is increased from 17 to 18 years of age. This means that from the 1st of April this year, an eligible person for the purposes of the duty on local authorities to provide continuing care under Section 26A of the 95 Act is a person who is at least 16 years of age and who has not yet reached the age of 18. By virtue of Article 3 of the 2015 order, the local authorities' duty to provide continuing care lasts from the date on which the eligible person <coughs> ceases to be looked after until the date of their 21st birthday. In summary, Part 11 of the 2014 Act on Continuing Care and the accompanying secondary legislation stresses the importance of encouraging and enabling young people to remain in a safe, supported environment until they are ready to make a more graduated transition out of care. This will help to normalise the experience by allowing strong and positive relationships between young person and uh, their carer to be maintained into adulthood. This draft order is essentially a procedural amendment to increase the higher age limit for eligible persons from 17 to 18 years of age as part of an agreed annual rollout strategy. Uh, so uh, that concludes my, my remarks, convener, and I'm happy, of course, to take questions on both of those draft uh, instruments. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Do members have any questions? Chick. Brief question. Good morning. Morning. Uh, in the in the uh, paragraph four five. It says the sheriff may hear evidence from the child or each relevant person in respect of the child. Now, in a previous 
the item discussed by this committee, we talked about the capacity of the child or person acting on behalf of the child. Who's, in these circumstances, who, who do you think agrees the capacity of the child and who agrees the capacity of, quote, each relevant person in respect to the child? Is that down to the sheriff? Well, th this is it's important, it's important to remember in terms of that. The first instrument, this is for children over the age of 12 uh, as well. So there will be always uh, appropriate ways to assess the capacity of that child. And there will have been close working before the decision was made to uh, uh, take the decision to put that child into a secure, uh, secure unit. Uh, John, do you want to talk about anything more around the social work officer's role within that and assessing the capacity? Um. I think there's, if I remember, there may be some in, in, in the 2014 Act that says that, um, or at least there will be, if my memory serves me correctly, there will be something built into the Sheriff Court rules that the Sheriff has, the Sheriff can take the views of the child, um, bearing in mind the, the age of the child and the, the ability of the child to offer um, a, a, a view. But again, in the previous conversation, there was the, you know, there's an age limit on that as well. But the question is, over the age of 12, there's still the question as to whether or not a child had the capacity to, to address the issues, or indeed the, 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 the parent or, or person responsible for the child, whether they had the capacity. Uh, are we saying that we're leaving it to the sheriff to decide? A child over the age of 12 will pre be presumed to have capacity, but clearly there has been, uh, will be, have been intervention in that child's life and there will have been a lot of uh, support there in place and other uh, interventions uh, because, of, uh, uh, because of the decision to put that child into a secure unit. Now, the other things that the, this uh, legislation is, uh, has to take cognizance of is getting it right for every child and all the, um, the, the checks and balances that are within that around making sure that child-centred decisions are taken. Um, and, but this, uh, this amendment is to allow that child, though, to have the same um, rights as if that child had been put into security unit through the children's hearing system to take, uh, make an appeal if they don't agree with that process. And, of course, uh, that's bringing this side of the, the, the secure unit legislation in up to pace with those children who are in place in secure unit through the hearing system. So this is about bringing about that uh, equality uh, and... Um, writing that kind of anomaly that has been there within the legislation. But there will be the GIRFEC legislation will kind of capture these children as well, making sure that it's a child-centred uh, decision because it's a serious decision. But this allows that child to take an appeal and make an appeal if they deem that that hasn't been appropriate. Thank you for that. As long as, I mean, I, I, you know, I think we support that, but it's important that we don't leave it to the sheriff to decide who's able and who's not able, that there is a basis of him making him or her making that decision. Can I just, on the continuing care, um, it says the policy now explains, the, the, in line with the passage of the, uh, the Children and Young People Bill, that continuing care provisions were being developed. This upper age limit will be extended annually until up to the age of 21. Why don't we just do that now? Instead of going 18, this, uh -huh. then next year 19, then next year 20. I mean, why don't we just go to 21 now? Well, for, for many of the members who have been in the, in the committee at the point in which we passed the legislation, the aspiration is to get to 21, but the practicalities of doing that has been the agreed rollout is annually every year, and that will capture the young folk who are about to, ordinarily, if the legislation and the law hadn't been changed, would have had to exit their, their care placement. So this is about the gradual increased uh, rollout of this policy to capture all the young folk who, I mean, it doesn't mean it make any difference because it was 16 to 17, 17 to 18, it's the same young people who eventually and essentially will get to the age of 21 and they can decide if they want to stay in their care placement. So that allows us to transition um, in a sustainable way to allow um, the care placements to cope and it was agreed as part of the rollout that this would be the approach taken. Okay, thank you. <laughs> my late arrival due to flight problems. Um, I think on that very uh, subject that, uh, that Chick Brodie referred to there, the Minister will recall um, during the passage of, of the bill, um, I, I was one of the ones that was uh, advocating a, an extension to 21. I think the argument that 
that the Minister's put in relation to why a more graduated approach was, was felt to be appropriate, I think, is, uh, is one that I think, I think the whole committee found um, uh, sort of compelling by the, by the end of the evidence. Uh, in a sense, what we want is put, to put in place something that's sustainable and, and delivers the, the objective. But, but certainly, I think, from what we were looking at initially, where um, the evidence we, we received suggested that some 16-year-olds would find themselves at a point, for example, where they were about to set um, sort of key life stage uh, exams, uh, we're finding that they were having to cope with, uh, with uh, being uh, exiting the care system, and that I, I think everybody accepted was not a, a, a place we wanted to be. So um, I think all I wanted to do really was to acknowledge uh, the fact that these, uh, the, the, these regulations are coming forward and, and uh, hope that they, they do now have the effect that we, uh, that we all uh, aspire to during the passage of the bill. Okay, thank you. Mary? Uh, thank you. Just a brief question on both. Um, uh, I thought it was interesting that you're actually repealing uh, the 1995 Act uh, 20 years ago, and we would always expect a right of appeal and new legislation going forward. But I just wonder, um, have you carried out a review of any other uh, rel re legislation relating to children which might require uh, subordinate legislation to bring forward a right of appeal, or is this just a one-off? Sorry, in, in, any, in any element of the children's yes, policy just at all? Given that this is tw you're devising right. something uh -huh. which is welcome, yes. that's 20 years old, uh -huh. I just wondered, is, are there any other, is there any other legislation relating to children where a right of appeal is absent? Have you carried out a, a review wider than this? I, uh, not, not to my knowledge, uh, Ms Scanlon, but if there are any or other things c uh, crop up, we'll uh, endeavour to let you know. But no, this is um, about making sure that this anomal anomaly is um, rectified to allow this group of young people to have the same rights of appeal as those through the children. I do agree system. with that. I'm just surprised that uh, it was 1995. But it's well, well, there are many welcome. parts of the 1995 Act. It's welcome many nonetheless. Many parties have, have been quite determined in making sure yes. that we don't, we don't touch. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and I'm sure you'll be well no. aware of, of the kind of policy differences that exist between our respective parties, but um, certainly uh, there is nothing uh, in the imminent horizon that is uh, to the fair to, to And the second point, Convener, relates to the, uh, the second uh, policy note, the continuing care. Um, I was just uh, slightly surprised that um, uh, no business case and regulatory impact assessment is necessary in line with the financial memorandum. And just listening to what you're saying, um, I wasn't on the committee when this Act went through, but the duty to provide continuing care and the strong positive relationships with carers, uh, is there no financial impact, no additional costs uh, for this at all? Well, part of the, you know, part of this is around the gradual rollout of the already agreed policy that, uh, that was captured within the, the, the Children and Young People Act, which had the accompanying financial memorandum, which uh, outlined the ways in which, uh -huh, which okay. I outlined how, and that was part of you know capturing what um, Chick and uh, Liam both said. This is about a, a sustainable <coughs> transition to get to the place where we want to be, which is around allowing uh, young people to stay in their care centre up to twenty one. And, and it was it was all it was all yeah. caught in, uh, in amongst the financial um, memorandum that was. Developed there are going to be that. additional costs, but they are already accounted for. That's really what you're yep. saying. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, um, thank you. Um, can I just clarify, you, in terms of the uh, secure accommodation um, amendment regulations, you've talked about the, the addition or the introduction of the appeal process, the new section 44A. And this one done, um, it's, it's covered under, I think, paragraph 6 of the, the policy note. You, clearly, this is, a, this is a, a welcome change, but I just wonder, Minister, has there been... Um, that you're aware of. Is there any adverse impact on any children involved in the process before now, given that we're now only introducing a, an appeal process? No, from um, memory, I think uh, there has been around five uh, children that have been uh, gone into the secure unit through this, this route and um, uh, through... So there is... It's, uh, this is more around making sure that the right exists for them to make sure that the legislation there is robust and allows for that appeal uh, because in the reality of it there are very few children and young people who are uh, insecure unit through this process however it's not that doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do so we have to um, 
and it was, uh, sorry, I'm just having a note, that the last report here, there was uh, confirmed that there was five children uh, not aware of any adverse effect on them, but there is very few ch children. This, this uh, statutory instrument is around making sure that the system is robust, allows for that appeal, uh, rectifies the anomaly, um, but the reality is that there have been few children uh, caught in this uh, uh, route into secure unit. Well, I appreciate that that is small in number, but clearly if those five individuals not not aware of not you're aware of any. No. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions from members? Well, th okay, thank you. As indicated, we now move to the formal debate on the Secure Accommodation Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016, which is item two. Can I invite the minister to speak to and move the motion? Uh, formally moved. Okay. Uh, thank you, Minister. <laughs> thank any, you. Contribu <laughs> any contributions from thank members? You. Okay, thank you. Um, can I put the question, therefore, that motion S4M 14968 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? agreed. That's agreed. Thank you very much. Um, we now move to the formal debate on the Continuing Care Scotland Amendment Order 2016, which is item three. Can I invite the Minister to speak to and move the motion? I formally moved. Thank you. Any contributions from members? Okay, thank you. Uh, therefore, I put the question that motion S4M 14984 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. Um, can I thank the Minister for, and officials for our attendance this morning? And I'll suspend briefly.
Um, our next item is to take evidence on the BBC Charter renewal process. Um, but before we uh, go to that, I have to inform members that uh, we did invite the BBC Trust here this morning, um, but they are not here, as you can see. Um, we had hoped the BBC Trust would have been part of this panel of witnesses, but unfortunately they have refused to attend. Despite first being asked to attend on the 24th of November, they would, as a matter of principle, only appear if we guaranteed they were on a separate panel, panel from the BBC. I have to say to members, it is for this Parliament and this committee to determine the makeup of panels of witnesses, and we note that the Trust previously appeared here in Parliament before the B uh, uh, sorry, appeared with the BBC before another panel uh, uh, for another committee. So clearly, although they have stated it was a principle, they have indeed appeared before a parliamentary committee along with the BBC before. Their absence is regrettable. Uh, and we will wish to consider whether they or their successors should be placed under similar obligations to attend before the Scottish Parliament as, as the Memorandum of Understanding places on the BBC more generally. Uh, but with that, um, I want to move on now, um, and can I welcome from the BBC uh, Lord Hall of Birkenhead, and Bulford and Ken Macquarie. Uh, welcome to all of you uh, here this morning to the committee. And I believe, uh, Tony, you've got some opening remarks you wish to make. Thank you, convener, and, and, uh, and thanks for uh, inviting us here <clears throat> to today. Um, what I want to achieve as Director General of the BBC is a strong and vibrant BBC Scotland, one which reflects the uh, nation it, it serves, is full of confidence in, our, in its output, um, and uh, is properly fearless uh, in its journalism. We all also recognise the pace of change in devolution and that it's changing asymmetrically, as you know, only too well right across the UK. Um, and, you know, part of that change is, of course, this new way of looking at the charter process with the Scottish Parliament, which I, I, I wholly welcome. Um, I say this in no spirit of complacency or arrogance, but I'm immensely proud uh, of, of the BBC and the output uh, we produce. If you just look at the breadth and quality of our programming over Christmas from Mrs. Brown, Sherlock, and so on, and the way that our news teams in particular uh, respond at times of crisis like the floods uh, here in, in Scotland and, and provide an extraordinary public service to our viewers, listeners, uh, and users online. Um, I've been following the evidence um, uh, provided to this committee, um, and, you know, rightly, there's been proper debate and, and criticism uh, of the BBC, but um, I, I hope what I'm also sensing is a belief in what the BBC should be and in public service broadcasting, which um, I, I have to say I, I welcome hugely. We're not without our flaws. We know that. Um, there's a lot to do, but there's also things that we can be, be proud of. Um, I just want to say a few words of context, if I might. First, um, I, I think you've got to look at the BBC in a global as well as a national uh, context. Overall, the thing which obsesses me uh, a lot is the fact that the uh, amount of money spent on UK production in the UK by UK companies is in decline. And I want a vibrant production sector uh, in the UK, which is not dominated by US studios, but is UK production for the UK and from the UK uh, to the world. And I want in that a strong and thriving Scottish production se sector to feed into that, to work in that, uh, uh, and, and to be um, uh, a real part of that. And I think that's the real prize. And that's why I put a huge stress on wanting an open BBC, not an arrogant BBC, but a B BBC that works as partners with people, supporting the creative industries, um, and also being an open platform where it's right to help others get visibility, not on, only in this country or in the UK, but also uh, globally uh, as well. I was really struck last night watching um, uh, the obituary uh, um, uh, 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 leading the, the 10 o'clock news by Sir John Sorrell, um, who said, talking about David Bowie, uh, said he represents the most creative nation uh, in the world. And I really believe that. The UK, Scotland, is an immensely creative nation. So one, production interests me a lot, and I think we've got a big role there. Secondly, we've got a role, and I've laid this out just before Christmas uh, in a variety of places, uh, saying that we need to look very carefully at how we serve uh, Scottish licence fee payers uh, and also we portray Scotland in, in two main ways. In television, the, the network supply review, which you've been uh, talking about and examining, I think has achieved a lot, 
but we can do so much better in telling the stories of Scotland to Scottish audiences, but also there from that uh, to, to, to the whole of the UK and I think to the world uh, uh, as well. So at the moment, uh, I am reviewing the way in which we commission across network uh, television. And one of the aims of this is to ensure that we are representing and portraying all parts of the UK, but particularly uh, uh, Scotland, and also looking at how we can uh, help uh, uh, sustain production uh, in uh, the nations. Um, I, I want to ensure that uh, in the next charter period, uh, we can uh, uh, ensure that we're not only telling Scottish stories of Scotland, but we're telling Scottish stories, Scottish dramas, Scottish comedy, uh, to the whole of the UK and beyond that, and looking at ways within that of ensuring that we can tap into uh, new talent, new writers, new directors, uh, and so on. Uh, I, and I'm sure you, we'll talk more about that, but I just want to lay that point out. The second um, issue around this is also around uh, news. Um, uh, I mean, the BBC's principle has been neither to lead nor to lag uh, in, uh, in, in devolution, but now's the right time uh, to say, are we getting it right and do we need to change uh, the balance? A lot of things have changed since the last time, before my time, that this was looked at by the BBC. I think it was in 2011. And my own view is this is a time uh, now to make a change. So we're looking at uh, a review of news, which will report uh, in the spring, this is a looking at the provision of news across television, uh, radio, and also uh, online. And, of course, in that, there'll be a debate about uh, what has become known as the uh, Scottish six o'clock news. But I want to make sure the discussion is about the totality uh, of our services as well and looks to the future, because I'm very aware that as you look at how people are consuming news, it's not just in the traditional and important ways uh, in terms of our main services, but it's also in things like mobile, online, and so on. I want to make sure those are match fit uh, as well. Um, I've already said that for online, there'll be um, a nation's front pages uh, for, for news, but today I also want to say that I want to say the exactly the same principle, that Scotland should have its own front uh, on the iPlayer, on the BBC Sport website, uh, and on the home uh, homepages as well. And I think as we catch up with where we should be on data, and we can personalise our services more, then this also gives us a huge opportunity to offer our licence fee payers in Scotland services which are more attuned to the things that they may want, uh, uh, and I think that's uh, important too. And finally, just to stress the um, open point I made at the very beginning, I think we've got a big opportunity um, with something we've called the Ideas Service, but also with the work we're doing in arts and in science, um, to, to open up the eye player to, to people who think like us and act like us and, and, and think in a public service um, uh, sort of way, where the eye player can be a backbone for what the BBC offers uh, our audiences, but beyond that, it could also be the backbone for the way which the Edinburgh uh, festivals, for example, also reach a bigger audience, uh, and we're looking at that because I think there's a, a, a lot we can do that uh, there. Finally, on um, uh, devolution and decision-making, um, I want to devolve more decision-making on how we provide services in Scotland to the BBC team in Scotland. Uh, it strikes me that in the technical language we always kind of use about these things, that um, there should be a, a service licence agreement for the whole of what is done in Scotland, and that should rest uh, in Scotland. And moving uh, 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 money between those services or looking at the quality of those services or adapting those services should be uh, a, 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 a matter for, for Scotland. I believe that very strongly. As you know, there's a review going on into uh, how we'll be governed uh, by Sir David Clementi at the, mo at, at the moment. I have made that point uh, strongly uh, to him. I also believe that in, if we go to uh, a unitary board for the BBC, then again, clearly, there needs to be uh, a member on that board uh, uh, representing Scotland, but also representing the, the, the fundamentals of public service broadcasting, which I know are, are, are very dear to all of us. Thank you very much, Convener. No, uh, thank you very much for those uh, opening remarks, uh, Tony. Um, I would very much welcome um, a review of the news service that you've uh, mentioned and also uh, the additional uh, web changes that you're talking about and iPlayer changes. But can I go back to, uh, I think, what can, was widely seen as a very ambitious and forward-looking plan um, that was put forward by BBC Scotland. Now, and I want, I want to ask Ken about this first, and then I'll come to you, uh, Tony. Ken, the BBC management, as I understand it, BBC Scotland management, put forward a very ambitious, wide-ranging, forward-looking plan 
for how BBC Scotland will look in the future. Is that the case? Look, before, um, when we were running up to the Charter, across the BBC we had a number of groups of which BBC Scotland was a part, and all of the divisions put forward a whole range um, of ideas, uh, various options uh, of ideas, and certainly um, I'm proud to say that in, amongst all of the ideas and all of the options, they were uh, driven by the desire to serve the audience better, uh, to deliver value to the audience, and also um, to contribute to the whole of the BBC's creative process. So, right, f so for the for a period of some 18 months, that work was going on across the BBC. BBC Scotland, specifically, as I understand it, Ken, put forward, as I said, a very forward-looking and ambitious plan for the future of BBC Scotland. Could you tell us what that plan contained? Well. Amongst the, the various plans that we put forward were uh, whether to deal with the audience in terms of uh, an online offer, uh, what the, the also uh, whether a linear channel was the right offer you know, for the audience. These were all of a range of options, uh, wh how we needed to make sure that we got younger audiences into the, uh, into the BBC uh, viewing and listening. Um, I was on the record at the Edinburgh Television Festival as saying that a channel uh, was one of the options which addressed a heartland audience, if you like, you know, the traditional BBC audience, but would not deal with bringing younger and more diverse audiences to the BBC. So, the, so if you're referring to amb ambitious plans in terms of the range we had absolutely had a, a range of options which were put forward in discussion in the, right through the 18-month period, but that was true of every other division in the BBC as well. But I'm sorry, I'm asking you specifically about BBC Scotland. Are you saying that the document you put forward was a, was a, a range of diff different options, or was it um, a specific, uh, effectively open questions about whether or not this was good or that was bad? Mm -hmm. Or was it a specific set of recommendations that you thought uh, and the BBC Scotland management thought would be uh, a, a, an ambitious future for BBC Scotland? The, the, that we never uh, reached the stage of having a formal document, as you, de you describe it. What we did have was a number of ideas. Uh, we had a preference uh, at one stage for um, looking and examining what the pros and cons of a channel were in delivering um, uh, a bespoke channel for Scotland, but it, I have to stress it was one of a number of options you know, that we put forward during that period. Can, can you just cl clarify? You did you didn't have a document. Uh, but we didn't. We had within the BBC's formal structures. We did not uh, submit um, a formal plan. It was part of the overall creative process of the Charter, which was about. How, so this, this how did you how did you let BBC Network or BBC London know? What your plans were? Did you just phone them up, or I mean, no? We, we 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 met in various groups from various divisions, and all the divisions put forward their range of options and a fairly broad range of options at, at the outset. That's that's how the discussion took place. It's fairly normal, you know. Normal process. I've been through um, a number of chapter reviews, and that that is uh, matches my experience in the past. What happened to the, I'm going to stick with the word plan, what happened to the plan that you put forward to the BBC for the future of BBC Scotland? I think the, in terms of the, the discussion, uh, we looked at uh, the various options, and that was in the context um, when we got to the stage uh, where we, the financial envelope of the BBC was clear. We looked at what, what the various options were, um, and at that stage, uh, we considered, we began to hone in every division across the BBC what the proposals would be. And that resulted in the document that the BBC submitted uh, to the DCMS. Chick, sorry, did you want to? Oh, I did simply ask the question where's the plan? Where's the written plan? Well, as I said, we didn't have a formal document as such, you know, in the... the, the well, you must have had a basis for your discussion. We had a basis for the so discussion, the which... We, the basis for the discussion, which was essentially uh, looking at doing an online 
um, an online delivery for Scotland, looking at the option of a linear channel. These were the sort of range of options that we, that we were involved with. It, it, you, you, you're, you're leading with the issue of online, but my understanding it dealt with an awful lot more than that, Ken. It dealt with a, the possibility of a new uh, television channel, a radio channel, talk about uh, full devolution of, of commissioning powers and budget and all the things that went with that. Is that the, is that the case? I'd, I'd, one of the options that we were looking at in terms of was uh, whether there should be a second service on Radio Scotland, whether there was, um, whether what was the balance of advantage of a radio service versus television service, how you would get to the various audiences. But I have to stress that these were a number of options that were tabled in discussion as part of the normal charter. Did it process. include? Did it include the things that I've mentioned? Commissioning, budget. The we in terms of the. Um, the, the range of discussions, where commissioning should sit and what should be commissioned, if you like, pan-UK and what should be commissioned from London was one of the areas that we, we, that, that we looked at. And that has resulted, I think, in the terms of the, the Director-General mentioned the review of commissioning that's ongoing at the moment. I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a yes, that it did include these things. Can I come to uh, yourself, Director-General? Um, that plan that was put forward to you, in whatever format it was put forward to you, what happened to it when it reached you? Let me, let me just add to the, to the process that Ken just uh, outlined. So um, what we were doing, we're looking at ways in which, um, ha had we um, had the opportunity, um, we could say uh, that the licence fee should go up more than uh, inflation. Uh, to fulfil a number of ambitions we'd have right across the piece, uh, uh, in, in, including Scotland. Now, um, what happened after the um, uh, settlement with the Chancellor uh, in July uh, is we had to uh, then say, what are the priorities that really matter to us? And I go back to what I was saying at the beginning, Convener. I think we... And, and by the way, uh, I just want to stress, uh, it's not just been BBC Scotland versus London. We've been really talking about this a lot be between us. But we then said, OK, so what are the priorities we've got um, for the BBC in Scotland? And I go back. I think the, the, the priority, talking with Ken, talking with others, um, but this is part of the debate, is for uh, production from Scotland, drama and other things for the network and also for, for the globe. So we thought put our money uh, more in that than in other things like a linear channel. Now, the second thing which is also going on is us thinking about the, the future of, of broadcasting. And whereas I believe channels will be important uh, for a long time into the future. I mean, BBC One uh, is doing remarkably well. It's the way to, to, to get to as many people as you can in Scotland or across the UK. Nonetheless, in certain areas, you can see uh, the way in which people are wanting what they want, where they are, on demand, uh, whenever they want it, and particularly in our younger audiences. So... The, insofar as we can prioritise our, our spending, clearly what we do in the nations is important, but also thinking about how we ensure, as Ken was saying, that the audiences of the future, younger audiences particularly, but, but also many of us too, can have the, the, the content that, that, that they want uh, where they want it. And in that sense, uh, building an online channel uh, seemed to us uh, important. Um, I, I would have thought both things are important. It's not, it's not one versus the other. Um, why is, why is it important? Why is it important to have uh, uh, UK channels such as BBC One, BBC Two, mm. BBC Four, etc., and radio the same, but it's not equally important to have um, additional Scottish channels as was proposed in that plan? Well, th this, is, this goes again uh, back to resources and how, uh, how best can you use the resources uh, that we've got. And you, you know what the settlement is for the BBC. Um, we, have, uh, uh, we have to absorb the over 75s. So I mean, I need... You, 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 you know all that. So within that envelope, um, we're looking at what are the, the best way we can serve uh, Scottish audiences and all our audiences across the UK too. And in that sense, uh, we've put a priority on getting our news right and also our commissioning and production base right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on now uh, with Gordon McDonald. Thanks very much, convener. And apologies for my voice. I'm just coming out the back end of a cold, so I'm a bit croaky. Um, in terms of the, the last comment you just made, Tony, about um, you seem to indicate that any additional services that could potentially come to Scotland was dependent on the licence fee settlement, if, if my understanding your comments are correct. Um, you also, it's also said in the statement you said to me 
that um, you submitted to the committee that during the current charter, steps were taken to ensure that spend on BBC network television in each nation would broadly match that nation's share of the population. Now, um, we did ask you for detailed figures for BBC Scotland, and uh, we were told that they weren't available. But curiously enough, you managed to provide headline numbers for income and expenditure. So I don't quite understand the difficulties there, if you can pre provide mm. the headline numbers. But taking your uh, annual report, which is what you actually pointed us to, and looking at the spend by service license in 2015, you spent just shy of £2.4 billion pounds on television. And Scotland's share, according to your own targets, of 8.6%, which is the population share, would have suggested that we should have had £204 million pounds spent in Scotland. Now, forget about local network and lift and shift and all the rest of it. You only actually spent £148 million in 2014-15. So that's a shortfall right away of £56 million. Pounds. We then look at radio. You uh, spent £652 million pounds on radio. 8.6% of that would have been £56 million. Pounds. You spent 30. So again, that's a shortfall of £26 million. Pounds. Uh, BBC Online Services, you had a budget of £201 million. Pounds. Scotland's share should have been £17 million. And the shortfall, we spent 11 and the shortfall was £6 million. Pounds. Now, that's a total shortfall of £87 million, pounds, which suggests that there is room to improve that situation. Can I just run through the figures as we understand them? And by the way, uh, can I just say to the uh, committee, I, I, I'm really happy to work with whomsoever at giving uh, clearer statements of what we're spending in Scotland uh, and also our performance in Scotland. And I think that, that, that uh, I, I don't know whether you're going to come on to that, but I, I'd very much like to do that because I think getting clarity about these things I think would be helpful for, 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 for everybody. Clarity, can you confirm that there are internal financial documents that highlight specifically the amount of money spent in Scotland, but at present you're not prepared to release them? Um, I, I, can, uh, I, I can tell you exactly what we're spending on network content in Scotland and local content in Scotland. Would, be, would it be helpful if I ran through what Is our figures are? Is that the two are? numbers you've already provided? These are the, 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 the numbers of 82.3 in the breakdown uh, for but, but network with content. With respect, yeah. that includes so many overheads, including overhead uh, share from BBC London. No, it doesn't. It absolutely does it not. It states in it that. No, no, no. It, it absolutely does not. I mean, I, I, I would love to get clarity on this because I think it would help everybody. The network yeah. content of 82.3 and the total local spend on all our services across radio, television, online, uh, etc., is 108.2, which gets you to, if my sums are right, 190 million. We have not put in there um, uh, 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 um, overheads in the network contribution. So, Anne, would you want to? If I, if, if, if I could help mm. um, to the, the committee convener, if that's, that's useful. The document that I think you were referring to from the annual report of accounts is this page 39. Or page 3. Uh, page 3. Yes, sorry, I've got the, the there are two sets. There's the, right. the, the, the one with the, um, the more um, chairman's report and things in the front of it. These are the detailed accounts. It's the same material. And that is showing a breakdown of television spend of 2.4 um, million, 2367.8. <laughs> yep. Uh, the first column of 1.8 billion outlines the content spend, mm -hmm. which is spend on content and mm. excludes distribution costs, lines and transmission, mm. content and distribution support mm -hmm. um, and general support, which includes yeah. the overheads that you were referring to. Within that, you can see the content budgets for the different services. Yeah. And under the NSR review, mm -hmm. um, as I understand it, the proposal was that the content budgets for BBC One and BBC Two, um, the proportion of that should match the population of Scotland. And that is where the overall target of 17% for the nation. I don't have any from. dispute about what's in the BBC consolidated okay. accounts. What I'm asking about so if I, is, if I is about the two figures for yes. the local content and network, which yes. says includes commissioning budge, budget but also centralised content costs such as studios, post-production, sport and other rights, property, 
uh, FM, IT, telephony, support and yes. maintenance, content, senior management yes. teams, transmission, I, I, media storage, training, etc., etc., etc. I'm sorry if it's uh, <coughs> if if our submission has been unhelpful in its clarity. In terms, first of all, of the spend in Scotland, uh, the content spend in Scotland, um, in the submission as explained, is 190 million. Um, that includes 108 million on television services, BBC Scotland opt out, and um, the related uh, uh, and spend on Alba for <coughs> television services. And that 108 million, um, that includes um, 34 million on online radio, orchestra, and Alba, and 73 million on television opt out in Scotland. That 73 million, 73.9, includes 35 million of cash spend, which is a number that has been spoken about quite a lot, which is for, if you like, above the line commissioning for writers, directors, artists, production team talent. Uh, the other half of that money is the costs of production, stu cost of production studios, uh, post production, outside broadcast rights, executive producers. Uh, property and IT, all of which is spend which is integral to the production budget. Any production budget, you would see those there in it. That spend sits in Scotland and is part of, of the spend in Scotland, commissioned from Scotland. So that 73.9 of television spend, part of the 108, uh, sits there. In terms of the network, which is the other part of it, um, 82 million network spend um, in Scotland. Um, which is uh, commissioned through from BBC One and BBC yeah, Two. I'm not, I'm not disputing the £190 million. Pounds. What I'm disputing is that you've said we would broadly match that nation's share of the population and taking your annual accounts figure that's summarised on page three, yes. there is a shortfall of £87 million pounds spent in Scotland. Uh, 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 I, the point I was trying to make at the beginning was is BBC it, One and BBC Two. I'm and, talking and, about total and, television. And the content spend, because the distribution and content and distribution support and the general overhead support, mm -hmm. that is not included That's in the percentage that million, was something like that. But That's the difference between the 1.8 billion and the 2.4, which goes some way to, to explaining these differences. Right. In terms of network spend of £82 million, pounds, um, we heard from last week's evidence that much of that spend related to programmes like Question Time, The Lottery Shows, Homes Under the Hammer, Waterloo Road, The Weakest Link, Antiques Road Trip. Now, the BBC said that it, that it was very keen. Hel the BBC helps connect the UK across all its constituents, nations and regions. It is that commitment to reflect the diversity of the country that has brought some of the best content to the nation's screens. Can you explain to me how those programmes I've just read out reflects Scotland's uh, view to the rest of the UK when most of them aren't actually based in Scotland? I, I'm just saying in a moment, um, Mr. Donald, just, let me just, just, yeah. just, just say something on that, because I think it's a, it's a really important thing. I, I, I think, uh, and I'm speaking here of a BBC before I arrive, but I think what's been achieved and w what you're going to the heart of the, with the... Uh, supply review was to say how do we match spending um, against proportion of the population for television and things were done there which I mean have set up bases and I think as Bektu was saying to you uh, last week have provided jobs in Scotland but what I'm saying is I want us to be more ambitious now with as it were the lift and shift debate has done things which have provided economic uh, value I think to, to Scotland and actually I think has changed perceptions within the BBC um, which is good, but I think the next part of our, uh, I hate the word journey, but let me say journey, I'm sorry to use it, journey, is to say, okay, now how do we, um, uh, how do we use uh, all our commissioning powers to have uh, dramas, comedy, uh, uh, documentaries that feel of Scotland, to Scotland, but also, as I, I say, go back, then use to the UK, but also use worldwide to the world. But I, I, I think that's what I was trying to suggest is the next part of what we, 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 we need to be doing. So, um, if, you know, this, the, the policy of lift and shift has been in place for nine years. So, how do you intend to develop a strong and sustainable 
sector in Scotland um, in order to rectify the position that's perceived in Scotland that production has moved up to, from London to Scotland for a short period of time to use up a quota and then when that programme finishes the production team just moved back to where the original base was. Yeah, How I mean, do we rectify that problem yeah, and build uh, a sustainable... Yeah, I, I, I mean, the word sustainable, I think, is exactly the right one. I think the second thing is we have overachieved against our network uh, commitment. It goes up and down for the reasons that you, you're just suggesting, su suggesting. This, to my mind, is the important topic which the commissioning review I've asked for, which will report by the spring, has got to answer. Uh, and, and, uh, and likewise, when we build um, BBC Studios, which uh, is, from, to my mind, a really important uh, way in which in-house production, which matters to the BBC, we are a programme maker, but we want to make sure we get the best programmes from indies, but also the best programmes from, from in-house as well, that that is properly represented in Scotland. And the strengths that we have in BBC Scotland, which are many, are properly there in, in production. So, uh, you know, uh, I want a detailed plan. Uh, it depends partly on commissioning. It depends partly on uh, the strength of what we do uh, in production. The third thing, I think, which is really important, and this is what I was interested to kind of begin to explore uh, with some meetings uh, yesterday in Glasgow, uh, is how we can work with the creative uh, industries in, I in Scotland uh, to build uh, a sustainable, to, to ca carry on building a sustainable uh, television base here. And, and, and I hope we can have... Uh, good conversations with Creative Scotland and others, and indeed the, the, the Scottish Government, about how we can best use our weight and clout to do that. Does that, does that, mean, right, does that mean that BBC Scotland, as part of your plan, will have a higher budget and have more control over commissioning in Scotland? Um, I've, I've, uh, I, as, as far as BBC Scotland's uh, concerned, m my plan, and these are all open for, for debate, because that's the process we're going through, would be uh, for Scotland to control uh, uh, the budget of what is done in Scotland uh, for Scotland. I then want to find the right way to cement BBC Scotland creatively uh, into uh, the UK uh, BBC in a way that I, th I think we've begun to do, but I think we can do uh, so much more. Thank you. Mark? Thanks, Kevin. Um, thank you for providing the, the figure that you have of the approximately 200 million pounds of spending that can be um, attributed to spending in Scotland. Um, you've also provided the figure of £323 million pounds of licence fee um, income. Are you able to um, describe what that um, additional £123 million pounds of um, spending that's not attributed directly to Scotland um, from the licence fee, are you able to briefly describe what that's spent on? Well, I mean, uh, in, in, in truth, what it is is the, is the balance of that figure between what the population actually, is, as it were, is contributing towards the BBC and what is spent uh, in Scotland uh, is the balancing figure for the provision of all the other services, uh, all the other radio services, all the other television services, all the online uh, developments and so on, which uh, uh, I hope uh, viewers, listeners and online users in Scotland enjoy. And, uh, you know, I take some comfort, but again, I'm not being complacent or arrogant about this. I take some comfort from the fact that you know, um, uh, we have an 88% um, uh, viewing figure in Scotland for our pan-UK services, which, which I, I think is good. We mustn't rest on our laurels. We've got to do more, clearly. Thanks for that. There have been um, calls in the uh, committee and evidence that we've had the committee and in the press for a, a more federal structure um, of the BBC and that for all of the licence fee income, that's £323 million pounds to be... Um, ring fence as it were to a federal BBC Scotland. Can you um, set out what the cost would be to those services that, like you say, 88% um, of the, the viewing and listening time in Scotland, what would the cost to BBC Scotland be of buying in those services that uh, lots of people enjoy? EastEnders, Match of the Day, Strictly, um, Sherlock, a lot of the programmes that we enjoy. Do you have a, a, a cost of, of, buying, of buying those in? We, we, we don't have a cost of, as it were, what it would be. If, if you said uh, I, th I think, if I'm understanding rightly, if you said, OK, um, we'll then decide what the cost would be of us saying, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll give you 10 million, what can we get for it, as it, as it were? I'm putting it horribly crudely, but, but, but forgive me. I can't give you that cost. Um, I, I read with real interest the, the uh, discussions going on last, uh, on January the 5th, I think, with, with a, a variety of uh, professors about the, the, you know, the nature of what a federal uh, BBC uh, uh, could be. 
the test for me, and it's one for actually the, the, the Westminster government and yourselves, um, uh, it is how can we ensure that the power that we have globally, the brand of the BBC globally, is intact uh, and uh, is, you know, that kind of strength is there for everybody across the UK. But at the same time, we're also reflecting and um, being a kind of creative hub for Scotland or for the north of England or, or, or whatever. And um, I think whatever we do in governance terms has to kind of reflect that, that together, if we are responsive and treat each other as equals, there is a huge amount we can do. I mean, what it is I'm trying to understand was the mm. call from, for a federal BBC structure in, ter in terms of the financial impact has been claimed that that 323 million would then be an automatic um, boost to the creative industries in Scotland of, of £323 yeah. million. Pounds. And I'm, what I'm doing is, is trying to understand the, the financial impact of a, a federal BBC. And if you were able to provide uh, further clarification as to um, what proportion of that £323 million in a, a, a federal um, structure would, would actually be going back to, um, to buy in the services that, as you say, um, take up 88% of the, the viewing and listening time of of uh, viewers in Scotland? At the moment, um, the, the 323 is the, is the licence fee estimate, which is, is, is a good estimate because that comes through from the way in which postcodes are allocated and all the rest of it. So I think we can treat that as an accurate number. The spend um, in directly in Scotland on local services, including all overhead and distribution in Scotland, is 123 million. So broadly, 200 million um, is the contribution into all other network services, all BBC responsibilities, everything around um, uh, distribution across the UK, including the iPlayer and the development of the iPlayer. So all of those services come through. Um, and if you um, look at the cost of uh, directly attributable to Scotland and the cost directly attributable to the network, um, what that shows is that the spend per head in Scotland um, is higher than the average um, across the whole of the UK because of that, that mix and size of population. So there's a contribution from Scotland of £200 million in, if you like, to the overall BBC pot uh, for all of those network services which represent 88% of the consumption. Now, if you were to go through the whole of the BBC and to buy on a spot basis all of those services right the way across Radio 1, iPlayer um, um, development uh, through to EastEnders, um, I, I don't know what that would be or how that would work through. Um, in, in, a, in an acquired system, so if you're ABC Australia, um, you can um, buy on an, uh, on, excuse me, on an acquisition basis individual titles on, on a value. But what you're not buying is that whole service Sorry. of which, um, th th which runs across the whole of the UK where everybody participates in everything. So, so that's the number um, which, which contributes back into the whole of the network services which the people of Scotland are able to access um, uh, for 40p a day. Okay, thank, thank, thank you very much. Clarify two points on what you just said there. Mm, yeah. Firstly, it seems to me you, you've ignored um, uh, two things. Firstly, you've ignored um, the additional money above the licence fee that come, is generated from Scotland, because um, it's not just the licence fee that BBC gets out of Scotland. There is additional uh, money that comes into the BBC. Sure. Um, and secondly, if it was the case that uh, the BBC Scotland had to buy stuff from the network, Anything that the network bought from BBC Scotland, again, you've ignored the, the, yes, the money from there. So yeah, it, works, although it the, works both the, ways. It, it would work both ways, of course. But, of yeah. course, that, that just to remind the um, convener, everybody, we've just been through this. Of that £200 million which contributes into network, um, £83 million is is spent in Scotland. Just making the so, point so, that it, so, it does work so both we're, ways. We're, 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 it's slightly apples and pears. But I want but to clarify one thing you just said there before I began, Liam MacArthur. You said that the, the spend in Scotland um, per head is, is higher than the rest of the UK. Higher than, uh, than uh, England, yes. Well, no, you didn't say that. What you I said know, was I didn't. I, I, I just so just for, just for the record, then, the spending in Scotland 
averages out total spend per capita is 72.1. That's right. In Wales, it's 83.6. It is. In Northern Ireland, it's 83.45. It is. In England, it's 52.05. That's correct. So Thank it's not higher much. than the rest of the UK. It's, it's, high, no. it's, it's higher than, than England, England, but lower than Wales and Northern Ireland. Lower than Wales and, and, just, and lower than the average across the lower, UK, which is what I should have said. Well, just for accuracy. Thank Ian you. MacArthur. Thank you, convener. Can I start, as I did last week, by declaring an interest, um, as I have a brother who works uh, currently as a journalist for the BBC. I, j I just want to take you back to following on from some of the, the exchanges with Gordon MacDonald earlier. Um, I, as you say, last week we heard, um, I, I think, different views on, on, on lift and shift, and I think um, you fairly pointed to the view of Beck to that this had created jobs, but I, I think that the accusation laid was um, where's the legacy of, of that? What was the, the value over the, the, the kind of medium to longer term in terms of that? I think one of the witnesses suggested that the likes of the weakest link in Waterloo Road had, had come to Scotland to die, um, which I, I think was in keeping with some of the, the more florid language being used uh, by that witness. What, from your perspective, or perhaps Ken might be able to, to address this, has been the value of that in terms of not just the, the, the jobs but the, the, the skills development and the potential then if there is no weakest link, if there is no Waterloo Road and, and, and programmes do have a, have a shelf life, what the lasting value of that is in terms of generating the next weakest link or the next dramatic production um, in Scotland from that base. Do you want to say something and then I'll, I'll chip in? Or should I, please? Okay. Just... Uh, Two, two, two points. Um, uh, w w one is, um, you know, we don't want to be... I mean, I, the programmes come to Scotland to die. I, I, you, you were right. I mean, it's, it was very, f f uh, um, very powerful language. Um, I don't think anybody uh, uh, I've ever met in, in <laughs> as programme makers, you know, they want programmes to succeed, and, and, uh, uh, and that's really important. But just to go back to the point I was making to, Ms. to Mr McDonald, which I think is the right point... You know, where I want to get the BBC um, with the help uh, of others outside the BBC is where, you know, we do have a sustainable, vibrant production sector in Scotland. I know when I was um, chairing the, the 2012 Cultural Olympiad, coming to Scotland and seeing what Creative Scotland was doing then was amazing. It's a ve uh, extra extraordinary creativity, and I want to reflect that in our, in our output. Now, I think there are things that, w that we can do to uh, cement much more closely, and it, Mr Griffin's point about, you know, should we kind of make the BBC kind of more transactional uh, between Scotland and, and the network. I think we've got to get to the point when it's absolutely like that uh, as a team, when the commissioning teams in London, uh, the commissioning teams in Scotland are actually looking at how we can, uh, how we can put high quality output across drama, comedy, etc., 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 both for the people of Scotland but also for the people of the UK, and then we hope through BBC Worldwide to sell that uh, globally. And, 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 you know, I think there are things being done in Scotland at the moment which I want to see on the network, which... which if I'm being frank, take too long to get to the network. This story of Scottish art, I think, is, 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 is terrific, um, and I'm glad that Shetland's coming back. But likewise, I take an enormous amount of pride from the fact that also, if you look at Doctor Who, of which I am uh, an addict, uh, the director, the star, and the, um, uh, the, 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 the key writer uh, are all uh, Scottish, uh, and two of those are also doing a brilliant job um, uh, with Sherlock as well. Now, that should be our aim that actually we have uh, a vibrant Scottish um, uh, uh, writing, directing, uh, scene in journalism, etc., etc., which we can then take uh, to the whole of the UK and, and beyond that to, to, to the world. So that's kind of the aim, uh, and uh, you know we want to partner with people to better do that. Right. I think it, it probably reinforces the fact it's not simply about reflecting Scotland to the Scottish population or indeed Scotland to the wider UK network or, or internationally. I mean, you've, you've pointed to the, the, the examples of Doctor Who and, yeah. and, uh, and in relation to, um, but also in relation to Shetland. Um, I understand that, um, <coughs> that there is an argument that basing homes under the hammer has led to a commission for uh, the production company there yeah. um, from, from Channel 4 because of the experience they had with Homes Under the Hammer, that, that likewise, in terms of the weakest link, the specialist skills there have led uh, to commissions for other quiz shows uh, on commercial television, so that actually the spin-off of this isn't necessarily always um, uh, it, with, with, uh, with the BBC. It, 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 does go, it does go wider. C com completely right. And I think, uh, you know, we've seen, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, here, but I think the quantum, was, I think you're all suggesting, I think is it should be more, 
Uh, we've, we've seen it in, in Salford. Likewise, that the BBC can act as an engine room uh, by commissioning, by building the, the, a local economy. People have the skills. They've got the track record, which then means they can go elsewhere. And I think you're also right. There's a balance between programmes which clearly uh, reflect Scotland, I mean, Shetland being a kind of uh, wonderful example of that, versus things which are, you know, could be anywhere, but are m made by, uh, by Scots uh, for a, a global audience. I think to... Sorry, Ken, you want to add something? Just, just to Mr. MacArthur's uh, question, it was enormously beneficial in terms of skills development for, for the sector in that some 70% of the spend that we've done year on year um, in the network strategy review has been from the independent sector. So with programmes, um, so, so we're not complacent because uh, to Mr McDonald's point about sustainability, that's something that we want to deliver, but also representation and we recognise we have to go further. But I wouldn't underestimate the colossal benefit to the skill sector of the hundreds of millions that have come in and been spent. And for example, if you looked at talked to representatives of the community in Greenock, they were enormously pleased with the Im economic impact of Waterloo Road based uh, in Greenock in, in an area which provided training and skills for, um, for young people. And we worked with, um, in terms of script writing, script development, we worked with uh, uh, the Caledonian University to, look, to train in that regard. We also worked with Skillset Scotland to provide executive drama production courses and get the skills that we require to fulfil um, all of our ambitions. So it, enormously important in that regard, but in itself, for my, not as far as we want to go on your points, Mr MacDonald, of sustainability and also representation. Thank you. Uh, Chick. Thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, can I preface my comments by saying I'm slightly more confident than I used to be that things will uh, change uh, radically, although I would hardly draw uh, an analogy between you know, having a Scottish actor uh, promoting development of Scotland. We have one in uh, California called Sean Connery. Um, the problem is, isn't it, the, the BBC is a monolith. And like all monoliths, have the, the potential to get into a death spiral by cutting or by not understanding what accountability they have. And we just heard through some of the numbers uh, there appears to be no real accountability on the ground, and, and the Royal Society of Edinburgh made a point that a stronger governance model with a greater level of accountability to the people of Scotland, as well as Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, is absolutely necessary. So accountability, accounting, it would be interesting to see what management fee is charged to BBC Scotland from uh, the, the headquarters of BBC UK. Management control in terms of freedom to control. Productivity and efficiency, operational performance, the uh, creativity that you mentioned. Why don't you just, as part of this uh, re re renewal of the BBC, not create separate companies, part of the unified BBC, but create separate company, a separate company in Scotland where all of these things can be achieved uh, and, and uh, give, at the end of the day, the accountability to the licence payer as to what we're actually spending. So we don't get into this argument about needing everything. And I have to say that, having read the report, that, uh, and I was surprised, uh, Mr. Mr. Director General, that you uh, referred to you're looking forward to BBC Studios, which really is looked like to me as if you're shuffling the pack, uh, that uh, it, that hasn't been decided yet. So how can you look forward to something that has not yet been decided that will become a wholly owned subsidiary of, of uh, the BBC. So wouldn't it just be simpler to say we're going to set up separate <coughs> companies responsible for accountability, performance, efficiency, uh, creativity, uh, and by all means having a unified policy, uh, but leave the <coughs> operational performance uh, to the various nations of the UK? Thank you. Uh, I, I'm not as... Uh, downbeat, uh, Mr. Brodie, as, as you clearly are about uh, the monolith that is the, 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 the BBC. I, I, I think uh, a unitary board, and I've, I've said this in public, um, where um, we are held to account, regulators, if you like, by a regulator outside the BBC. That's the first time I think a director general said that. 
um, I think would give the um, clarity, accountability, um, and the devolution of the right things between the centre and uh, uh, really important areas like Scotland. I think a unitary board uh, can do that in a business-like and properly effective way. I think it's a big change of culture, um, but we are about reforming the culture uh, of the BBC. Uh, just to uh, say one thing to something you said there about the, the overheads, uh, as it were, pressed down on, uh, on Scotland, uh, Anne Bulford here, uh, with a bit of help from me, uh, is doing a huge amount of work to cut back on the amount of money we spend on overheads. And by the way, overheads sounds like uh, a bad thing. Uh, you know, we depend as a broadcaster on support services and people who work their socks off to make sure that we get our services on air. But nonetheless, we want to make sure that as many pounds as we can uh, get spent uh, on, on, on programmes. I think we can work an effective way for the future of the BBC um, uh, within a, a unitary board. And I say it's very interesting because actually I, I can see what's, you know, what's kind of the, the, the way you're thinking about this. I think the power of us being together but with clarity about who's responsible for each uh, as a big global brand is really powerful. And I think that's something that would be much simpler, wouldn't it? If there was a separate BBC Scotland company will be part of the BBC oh. Empire. Otherwise, how do you know, without the accounting mechanism, how do you know that you're making cuts in the right place oh, okay. or you're not making investment in the right place? So, uh, you know, we talk about, and we'll come to commissioning later, but, yeah. you know, um, looking at the diaspora of the Welsh, the Northern Irish, the Scots, you know, are we doing enough internationally? I know BBC mm. Worldwide does mm. reasonably well, but it could do a lot better. Mm. And a lot of the emphasis seems to be going on to this business of, and I will agree to disagree, keeping this element together, when in fact there's no reason that it shouldn't work together and work in partnership. Mm. But I'm talking about management, effective management control, yeah. which doesn't exist. Yeah, well, I think uh, effective management control, well, let me say, the, the, the BBC is not out of control, if that's what you're also suggesting, Mr Brodie. I don't think you are, but I know, I know exactly what you're, what you're suggesting. I think there is a very effective way of us managing the BBC in a simpler and a leaner way. And uh, uh, in my time at the BBC, I want to make sure we achieve that. And I want to make sure that the creative voice of the BBC, which is the one that matters, the programme making voice, the people who are actually you know, doing the things which fill up our airwaves with, with, with content that we love, that that is simpler and is clearer and is much more responsive within the BBC. Just one other thing. Um, uh, you, 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 you mentioned um, studios, uh, and of course that's got to go through the trust, it's got to go through all sorts of things. Um, I, I, I'm saying my belief in it because, uh, as I said earlier on, I profoundly believe in the BBC's role as a programme maker, and I want that to thrive and I want that to continue. And one of the values of BBC Studios, uh, the in-house production arm, will be to ensure that we are getting the very best ideas from the nations of the, of, of the UK. Uh, because I think that is something which increasingly um, uh, will be important for what the BBC does. But let me also stress, I also want to make sure we've got the very best from the indie sector too, because boy, do they do fantastic programmes for us. Right, I'll come back to that in a minute, but well, I, okay. I, don't, I don't think that, with all due respect, uh, as I say, shuffling the pack, okay. it's that, management control that, that really matters. That, that, I'm, yeah. I'm going to stop that, because I've got a number of issues I do want to go on. Sure. One of them is commissioning, but I know that yeah. Mary Scanlon's got some questions in this. So to... Yes, it's really on, on the same front of accountability and governance. But I wonder if you'd mind, I did read through your submission, and it was your response to Gordon MacDonald. You never mentioned the Scottish Parliament on the Parliament channel. And is, is that included in your expenditure, because it was, it was nowhere in your submission. Is it included in money spent in Scotland? Uh, it, it, it is. I, I'm not I sure if it is. It's I, is, is it's part of the Parliament channel, but I, I, I'll check uh, that. And, uh, we, we can get back there to There is quite a significant That's amount right. going out there. Yes. But that may be under Parliament channel as opposed to I think it is. Scotland. Yes, but it is being produced in yes, Scotland. It is, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Maybe we might even be on the channel, given that you're uh, here today. Uh, for well, I hope that's, not, knows. I hope that's not the <laughs> reason to be influence. on the channel. I hope you're on the channel because you should be on the channel. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, um, before I get uh, slapped down by the convener, I'd just like to throw in these uh, bits of information. It's really about the memorandum of understanding in future, and uh, Colin Beattie and I are both members of the Parliament's Audit Committee, so when the memorandum of understanding went through, we... Uh, actually um, succeeded in, in getting a small change. But I do see that uh, in your submission, consideration is being given to how statistical information, <coughs> <coughs> including Scotland, 
can be incorporated in your accounts. So, in order to allow this Parliament um, to do the job we're tasked to do, uh, can, can I just ask how uh, the BBC will ensure that the information from BBC Scotland, including all financial information contained in the annual accounts, uh, how that will be made fully transparent uh, in order that this Parliament can scrutinise really everything that we're looking at today. We all want more to be done within BBC, BBC Scotland, but the convener did raise the point last week that uh, it will be the BBC UK's annual accounts. So what I'm looking for is a commitment that there will be more information reflecting what's happening in Scotland going forward. Uh, if I could ask that question. Uh, so we, we are laying the report and accounts uh, for the BBC uh, before you, uh, before the Scottish Parliament, uh, for, for, for scrutiny. Um, uh, what I want to do then is to work out uh, what is the best way for us uh, adding to that the detail about performance, about expenditure uh, in Scotland, uh, and also for Scotland to the network, to give you the clarity uh, that you can then scrutinise what we're doing and, and hold us to uh, account. Because yeah, although the uh, audit committee will obviously be looking at the figures, it is for this committee yeah. uh, to look at how it best reflect. Yeah. But really, uh, I, I mean, I hear what you're saying about looking forward to a strong and vibrant Scotland and more decision making in Scotland. And you've obviously heard or read last week's evidence. Mm. But really, what I would like to think that this process would lead to would be a much more positive footing and understanding going forward. So how will the BBC seek to avoid future arguments about the spend in Scotland? I mean, is it realistic to say this is the amount of licence fee paid, so we need all that spent in Scotland? Should we be looking at quotas or, you know, what can we do instead of arguing about what was right and wrong and lift and shift and all the rest in the past? What can we do to use this opportunity looking forward to make sure that there's, uh, you know, we're on a good footing in terms of spend and production in Scotland. Do you want to have it? Yeah. I, I think that there, there are two things to consider. First of all, um, Tony, uh, the Director General, spoke earlier about um, looking at the way in which the service licences currently work and structuring um, those in the future, which will be a matter for. for uh, the governance body in due course, the other side of charter, but there's clearly an opportunity uh, to make the objectives in the service licences um, relevant to Scotland and, and, it, and so far as we can move towards an overall service licence for um, Scotland, I think that would be helpful and then that would give us a framework to monitor against which, which people can use. What does that mean practically that, in terms of impl uh, implementation? What is a service licence for Scotland? The service licences are, are the basis on which we report at the moment. Yeah. So the um, amount of uh, money and resource allocated into BBC One by genre, uh, for example, is, is encompassed in a service licence um, uh, agreed with and administered and monitored by the BBC Trust at the moment. Um, so all of our commissioners, all of our services work within a framework of, of what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and there, there are service licences for the specific Scottish services and we need to think about how we could pull those together in a way which is more helpful in giving a view of the whole. I think the second thing, and um, uh, I, I have found the exchanges um, around the numbers and how do they fit and how do they reconcile into the group accounts actually helpful in, in helping us sort of think about how we best uh, produce information to give you the sort of line of sight that you want to have and, and that we need to have in order to have a meaningful discussion around this table without spending too much time arguing about which number reconciles to what. Right. Mm. Um, and, and I think it's going to be very useful um, to work um, closely with officials to get to an agreed framework which we can then use um, when we come speak to you year to year so that we not only have good information in front of us on this year but we have that all important information mm -hmm. um, for, for um, those of us who, who spend a lot of time on this stuff giving you trend um, because of course if, if, if you find yourselves looking at figures in slightly different formats from year to year that, that can bring a frustration so we um, look forward to presenting the accounts. 
um, and, and uh, as, as set out in the Member of Understanding. And I think thinking about what material needs to come with that to, to aid discussion is important. Because I don't, I, I don't want this to be a point of contention in the future. It says, it's my, my understanding of the memorandum of understanding is that you will present to the Scottish Parliament yes. the UK accounts, yes. the UK report. That's right. right. So just for absolute clarity, so both Mary and I and everybody else yes. here is clear, what exactly will you present to the Scottish Parliament beyond that? I, I think what I was saying is that what's very clear from, from the meeting today and the material um, um, exchanged ahead of it is that we're going to need a format of supplementary information that, that's in an agreed no, no, format. I know it's a format. What I'm trying to, trying to ascertain is what is that format? What is, well, is, I is, think is, it a full set of, is it a full set of accounts giving income expenditure for BBC, for BBC Scotland? It, it, broken down by all the categories that we've been trying to a, a full set of accounts would mean a different things to different people, but I think the material that a full we've set been, of figures. Uh, the, <laughs> the material that we've been talking about today in terms of licence fee income, spend in Scotland, proportion of the network spend, that is exactly the sort of material that it seems to me you're going to ask us about, and therefore we need to agree a format of giving you that data so that we can have a meaningful discussion. The detail of it, the format of it, I think is going to need to be worked through. Yeah, just a final point. Um, I, I don't think there a is a, of the a, a convener. I don't think we are in contention on this. I think. No, no, no okay, I don't. As a member of the audit committee, and I retire in ten weeks, so I won't be asking yes. you the questions. But um, uh, in future, I have no doubt that the audit committee of this parliament, which in my mind is a very effective committee. Um, they will be, you know, the UK accounts are really of no interest. So were the audit committee to ask you for a breakdown, of, as the convener says, income expenditure, a breakdown that more reflects what yes. is done in Scotland, that is something that you would positively work with the committee in order to bring that forward. Yes, that what but, I'm looking but for? with that information being clear as to how it fits into yes. group accounts, that's yes. the key that's to, right. to avoid a lot of complexity. Of uh, George Adam. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, uh, I'd like to talk about commissioning uh, with regards to uh, television, television content in particular. Tony, I take on board uh, all, everything you've said so far with regards to your ambition and how you want to review it and how you, you see there's an issue and you want to deal with it. But some of the evidence we received last week was there were some that felt the process was quite archaic. Uh, they found it was quite difficult for them to actually get any content. Uh, put forward. So how can we formulate a way that will enhance commissioning for Scotland? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, let, 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 me, let me say, I think, I think uh, uh, our aim is, is to have a commissioning process which is, which is simpler uh, and more direct. Um, I think you know the way that commissioning happens at the moment. There are uh, controllers for BBC One, BBC Two and so on. Uh, and then there are commissioners by genre uh, uh, working to them, sifting ideas, nurturing ideas and building ideas. Uh, there are four such uh, commissioners uh, working out of Scotland. Um, uh, and what I've asked television to do, uh, uh, Mark, to do, uh, is to uh, examine how we can make that much more porous, uh, simpler, uh, and more in tune with what I pick up from people when I talk to people, either in Scotland or in Wales or Northern Ireland, or indeed in the North of England, which is we want more, uh, more access to commissioners. But also, frankly, and this is the difficult bit, if it's no, let's have a no quickly. So I, I, I think, you know, um, BBC One and BBC Two are in fine fettle at the moment. We're doing extremely well. As I'm, you know, not for one moment, I'm not saying, you know, we're, we're not in good creative shape. I think we're in very good creative shape. But I think we can respond more um, creatively to, uh, to some of the, 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 the questions that people are asking of us. When you say four commissioners are working out of Scotland, mm. what do you mean by that? You know, I know there's four commissioners that are they, they based in BBC Scotland. They're, they? based in, they're, they're based in Pacific Quay. Uh, they are uh, working uh, across the piece for uh, television, working into the controllers. Okay. And uh, I can tell you uh, who they are. Um, and uh, uh, there's a, a commissioning editor for Factual. There's one for Comedy, which is good. Joe Street for, for Daytime. Uh, and also a commissioning editor for entertainment uh, commissioning. Now, one of the things we'll be looking at is, uh, I, I think we need to say, is, does this match the sort of output we would like to uh, um, develop and work with in Scotland? Do we need to look at uh, other things that we might do from Scotland? I mean, our arts programming is amazingly strong from Scotland, but that's all part of what we're looking at now. Uh -huh. 
you actually brought this up yourself but being a big fan of Doctor Who I am as well so you're my excuse for actually talking about this I like it even more now because as you stated the showrunner Stephen Moffat comes from my hometown of Paisley you know so it's uh, but one of the that's a good example when you look at when you look at a genius, he, well, to, 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 I'm sorry, but uh, to, 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 to be able to run in his head Sherlock and Doctor Who uh, all at the same time and deliver so much, I don't know how he does it. He's, it's just he the is. way we're brought up in Paisley. Well, it's very. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh... <laughs> could, I, could, I, could, I, could, I, could I bottle some of that and have it? <laughs> so basically, the, but I'm using that as an example because of the commissioning. Because if you look at it, uh, and I'll use two shows that are in the same mm. genre because mm. uh, I know you commissioned by mm. genre as well. But uh, basically, Doctor Who happened in 2005 because BBC wanted to revive it. Mm. They went down there, they wanted Russell T. Davis. Yeah. He said, I want to do it in Wales. Yeah. You know, so it wasn't, uh, he decided it was going to Wales. It wasn't something that organically yeah. came from Wales itself. Uh, There's another example of the uh, same genre, same time, uh, about 2006, Life on Mars which was originally written to be based in London, yeah. but because you had the production facilities up in Manchester, everything was changed mm. to make it a show based in Manchester. Mm. And what I'm trying to say is, you know, how do we get to this situation where, uh, you know, all the parts of the BBC and BBC Scotland, in our case in particular, mm. are organically feeding into all yeah. this so that yeah. it's actually, you know, some of the, the classic drama shows that we've had in the past, like Tutti Frutti and things like that, are getting network television and, yeah. and it's coming from Scotland, not yeah. particularly just about Scotland, yeah, but, but it's from, actually coming from Scotland. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 for, for me, uh, that's a big uh, question. I think when you use the word organically, I think that's exactly right. That's how I think you know, a, a properly networked BBC should, should operate. And we should be looking uh, at things which can be sustainable in Scotland, as Doctor Who is for Rose Locke. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other things that were the evidence we received last week was Professor Blaine and Professor Beveridge. They suggested that uh, it might be an idea to help the commissioning side of things that if, for example, BBC Two had been moved lock, stock and barrel mm. into a big container truck and brought up to Pacific Key. Now, that could be a way of looking at one of the major channels and a major commitment by the BBC mm. to do something down mm. that line. And uh, a lot of the people, the independent producers, that gave the evidence, they liked that idea mm. as well because you'd have a major player mm. right now our doorstep. Mm. You know, so uh, w w how do you think with regards to that, a lot of major channel coming up to the being based in Pacific Key? L let me put, put this another way. I think uh, uh, the, you know, the BBC uh, now has... Uh, half its spending, half its people outside of the M25 and London. That is a good thing. Well, that's because uh, you moved uh, all the news to and, Media City. And, uh, that I would was like, overnight. <laughs> and I would like to see more of what we currently do uh, centrally in London uh, move out of London. And, and that's the question I've got, whether that's a channel, whether it's whatever, I don't know. But I think... I go back to something I feel very strongly about, about the, about the BBC and why I do think organisationally uh, you know, we need to bind ourselves together uh, uh, in, in as close a way as I can because I think the strength, one of the strengths of the BBC is that it should be integral and part of the nations that make up the UK and working really effectively in the nations of the UK and at the same time being global. That's an enormous strength for Scotland. It's an enormous strength for the UK. And I want to make sure that, that we kind of reflect that in what you do. I mean, I, I sat and watched, just to add to the, the theme, I sat and watched um, breakfast this morning. It feels different coming from the north. And actually, it's interesting seeing uh, the perception of the BBC in the north of England uh, is uh, better now that, uh, uh, that, 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 that we're in Salford. And that's important. Can I, can I just um, take you back to the four commissioners you mentioned based in Scotland, I think that's what you said. You, just for absolute accuracy, when you say based in Scotland, because one of the arguments about lift and shift is the, or something, the trolley brigade that arrives at Pacific Key on a Monday and leaves on a Friday. Um, they're not, when you say based in Scotland, do you mean that they live here and they work here? Uh, based means the primary place of residence is here. So, the, yeah. so they live and work? Yeah, yeah, they live and, and work right. here. But I'll, I'll, let me just, I, I, I'm absolutely certain that's their mortgages their families are, are living here but that's as uh, that's how i interpret it yeah. well uh, just just for clarity because yeah. it's been suggested otherwise but anyway yeah. um, can, can you clar that, clarify yeah. in terms of the the, the the again the four commissioners are they commissioning uh, work for scotland are they scottish commissioners are they commissioning no. using the scottish the, commissioning the, budget the, the, those are network commissioners and then there's a separate set which ken maybe can talk about who are commissioning for scotland i'll come on to that in a second okay. 
Uh, can those commissioners um, take the final decision on commissioning, or does the final decision not rest with them but rest in London? The, the uh, final decision for anything is always a long conversation uh, uh, between a controller and a commissioning um, editor and, and so on. So it's a, it's a conversation that takes place. And, uh, and clearly, if you trust the commissioner and you know that that person's doing good work, you're going to go with what they say. So it's, it's a com that the whole of the creative so the industry is based around a conversation. Uh, well, yes. But who eventually decides the, the no, point of that okay, conversation? Okay, specifically to answer your question, you know, if you're controlling BBC One or BBC Two, in the end you'll say, well, that's the, you know, that's the programme I kind of want. But uh, life in the BBC ain't like that. You normally have uh, someone who believes in something, being passionate about it, and arguing a very good case. So, you know, uh, these things are, are discussions. Well, so I think I take that as a yes, that it's, it's, it's London that finally decides. It would be the controller who would finally decide, but, but I don't want you to think it's a sort of, you know... Um, I wasn't suggesting I, it was dictatorial. I was no, suggesting that that's where the final decision was taken. <laughs> Good, yeah. Um, can I just uh, clarify, and this may be come on to what the Ken stuff about mm. uh, BBC Scotland uh, commissioning itself. Um, how much of um, the budget... Uh, so what is the commissioning budget for BBC Scotland, Ken? Well, in terms of the programme-making budget... It's um, 67.9 is the, um, is the commissioning budget for BBC One and Two. It's the budget for BBC One and Two Scotland. But as we've indicated, uh, that contains um, sports rights, property, FM, IT, telephony. But that's what you need to make the programmes. So that's no, the I total, understand that. That's, a, that's, that's the total, total budget for except BBC Scotland. Except how, uh, how much of that budget does the commissioning editor uh, have at his discretion or her discretion? To spend. Well, uh, I'm sorry, Convener, is it okay mm. if I go back? Because this is I, uh, this is this, the material that I spoke about earlier. Mm. Um, the commissioning budget for television in Scotland is divided into two parts. There are the cash budget. There's the cash elements of the individual programmes, which sometimes are described as the commissioning budgets, which are the um, allocations into talent, directors, that kind of thing. The other part of it, which is studios, post-production outside broadcast and all the other tip material you, meet, you need to make the programme is held in Scotland, but not necessarily with the, in, in this, it, it isn't referred to as the same way as the cash commissioning budget. The combination of the two gets you to the commissioning budgets for Scotland. But just to be clear, those aren't somehow controlled from London. Those are the studios and outside broadcast, post-production facilities, edit stuff, which I'm is... I'm trying is to find out what the actual budget is that the commissioning editor in Scotland has at their discretion to spend? They, they have um, a cash budget of £35 yeah. million, if you like. They have an allocation of the resources which goes with it. I understand that. But, so they have a cash budget of £35 And then they have the, the resource that. allocation that comes with it because you can't make it without the other half. I understand that. So they I'm have not both. trying to suggest otherwise. Uh, so, uh, um, which takes you back to it's, it is the £70 million in so the round. So they have a cash budget at their own discretion to spend. Um, of all the programmes that are made uh, for the network by BBC Scotland, how many of them are commissioned by BBC Scotland? For the network? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, I suppose that the programmes that actually appear in the network, as opposed to specifically make... If we take the example of Stonemouth, mm -hmm. Stonemouth would be an example where BBC Scotland um, funded with the network that drama, uh, where we had local funding in that, but and that was... Uh, that went on to the network. We also um, have in trying to ensure that as much of the programming that we make locally in Scotland, we call it Nations to Network, appears on the network. And often there are a variety of the primary decision of all that's made in Scotland, including these programmes that, like Stonemouth, that eventually appear on the network, rests with uh, Ewan Angus, our television commissioner. So I'm trying to uh, differentiate here between the lift and shift productions, for example. Uh, the Lottery Show is not a programme that was commissioned by BBC Scotland. No. But no. it appears on the network. It's made in Scotland, it appears on the network, uh, but it's not commissioned by BBC Scotland. Uh, absolutely not. What I'm trying to differentiate between those type of programmes yes. and those programmes that were specifically uh, uh, commissioned by BBC Scotland and appear on the network. Yep. So if you can give me, give me the total, if you like, but also give me the breakdown between those two groups. Well, the, the breakdown um, is on BBC One, including all the figures, is 14.15 was 49.4 million locally. Um, 18 so, sorry, what's that? What's the 49.4? What 49.4 is that? 49.4 includes the, the, the cash budget, the, if you like, the direct cash budget, but also all, this, all the 
sports rights, other rights, the all. No, all sorry, the, what, know, what was it for? What was the 49.44 for? For BBC One Scotland, for the programmes that would opt out on BBC One Scotland. So that's programmes commissioned in, in Scotland, not for the network? Not for the network, yeah. Right. And then on BBC Two, the figure that we supplied you with is 18.5 for our local content does that, service. Does that figure include the, the news? Uh, that figure does include the news, yes. Right, let's take the news out of it. What's the figure without the news? That the figure without uh, the news would need to do uh, extrapolate the over net over when you take the you'd have to would rather come back G give me an estimate rough, roughly what it is then. approximately if we take um 14 to 15 million out for the news you know that right. would give us the figure right so uh, the actual budget of which i was trying to get to of bbc scotland commission programs not the lift and shift stuff and excluding the news obviously for obvious reasons is what the the, bud, the budget for BBC Scotland. Mm -hmm. it, it's what well I've given you the the figures which I, I think uh, if you take the the news out of it um, that we're at a figure of approximately um, 30, thirty five thirty 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 five million is the is direct cash spend. You know, no, hang on a second, Ken. No, hang on. Let's go back. Sorry about this, but you said it was forty nine point four. That was cash. BBC. And for BBC One. cash and yes, I understand that cash and all of the other fixed costs. Yes. So you take out the, what you said, roughly 15 million for news. That gives you back, takes you back down to around about 35. So 35 million was for not only cash spend at the discretion of the commissioning editor, but also the fixed costs. Well, if, if we take the, the total um, figure for the local spend, um, not counting BBC Alphabet, of the order of 68. Million. So if you take your 16 million off, then you're down to um, a figure of approximately 52 million across BBC One and BBC Two. Well, let's go back through this again. Okay, Gordon, on you go, Gordon. A very quick supplementary. Just on, on the figures you've just given, I'm, I'm a wee bit confused. Um, the management review numbers for 2014-15 giving you the 882 hours of Scotland's local television. 80% of that was news, current affairs and sport. By hours, yeah. So are, are you saying that um, the remaining 20% used that large disproportionately? Yes, yes. yes the, the cost of other genres outside news is, is, is much higher. So if you're making drama, it's much higher. If you're making high-end factual documentaries, comedy, entertainment, the, the comedy in particular, these, these are much higher. So the figure that we've given you for 14-15 was 67.9, you know, which includes the news, which we've just discussed. And, and given that 80% of BBC Scotland's output is news, current affairs and sport, and we, I think there was talk earlier on that there should maybe be a separate service licence agreement for Scotland, how do we change that proportion of output, important that news and current affairs yeah. is, to be more reflective of the network, which news current affairs is only 22% as opposed to 61% in Scotland. Well, I think we've in, that we've invested in, in news in Scotland because obviously there will be... Over but I'm the, thinking of the, the non-news aspect of it. Well, the non-news aspect, I think that's part of the discussions that we're having here today in terms of the what the mix is. It's one that will be... Uh, decided in relation to giving the best or but there is a disparity the there where 61 percent of scotland's uh, local output is news and only 22 percent in the network in fact it's 15 percent in excluding sport it's 15 percent in the network yes i think in, t in terms of the total services of the bbc uh, in scotland news is a higher proportion of our overall offer to scotland than it is for the the, by if, by, by the by, uh, for, than it is for the network. But if we the want to reflect the diversity of the nations and regions of the UK, surely the um, proportion of non-news emanating from Scotland should be substantially higher and closer to <coughs> the network, which is 85% if, it, if you strip out news and current affairs on its own. I think the, in terms of 
addressing the audience need and ensure that getting that what the figure is, Mr. McDonald, in terms of what the balance should be between news and the non news, you know, is a subject which we could discuss, you know, over over the coming over the new charter. But at the moment we're the, the in terms we're given the detail of how we've laid out the spend by genre, you know, to you in, in, a, in response to your supplementary questions, and that sort of gives an indication. Uh, that are obvious um, in terms of balancing by outage. The news is always going, you know, I think in a, in a Scottish situation because of we're addressing um, all of the, the needs of the populace as far as democracy is concerned, it's going to be a substantial part um, of our output. What the right balance is, is something that we need to consider in relation to the consultations that have come in to the BBC Trust and also the various consultations that have come in f to the Department of Cultural Media and Sport, and then looking at the audience and where we deliver the best value to the audience. Thank you. A very brief supplementary. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I'll get off the numbers because clearly we don't know what the numbers are. And to avoid circumlocution from my point of view, I would expect to see a full set of accounts with supporting evidence and supporting inf information. I say that as a former financial director of a large company. Uh, one question I, I want to ask. Earlier, uh, Director General, you mentioned uh, you included indies in terms of uh, production. Does that, or will that include uh, a, an independent producer who might also be a broadcaster? I, I, go on. I'm so sorry, Tony. <laughs> go, go it, it, it includes non-qualifying indies, uh, so non-qualifying independents, which do include um, independents who are owned by broadcasters, yes. So, for example, ITV Studios would count within, if you like, the non-in-house is labelled indie and then the non-qualifying non indie independence for the purposes of the quota count well, within in, in that. In terms of the quota, though, today, does that, or will it mean that, for example, Scottish television uh, as a broadcaster would now be able to produce uh, programmes for BBC? Um, Scottish television does indeed produce programmes for the BBC. They, their status um, under the uh, regulation is as non-qualifying independent. Okay, thank you. Can you, uh, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mia. Um, I'm looking at the BBC's submission, and the pages are not numbered, but I think it's page two, uh, third paragraph down, and it states here the BBC is also proposing to remove its overall in-house guarantee of 50%, being the 50% outside London, basically. And there's a positive spin to that in the, in the submission here. But isn't it a double-edged sword? It could go the other way. Um, 50% is uh, for an in-house guarantee for uh, television production uh, overall for in-house. 25% then is for indies, and 25% is the window of creative competition, the WOC, as it's uh, uh, called. And what we've been uh, saying to PACT and to uh, others has been, if we can, uh, if our in-house production, aka BBC Studios, uh, can be given the ability to uh, tender for work outside the BBC, because every time I meet in-house producers, I'm tripping over ideas, they're tripping over, I'm tripping over ideas that they, that they have, then at the same time, we could, uh, as it were, liberalise um, our... Uh, current commissioning arrangements to say that there ought to be freedom to to compete for indies versus uh, in-house production uh, right across the piece, except in areas of uh, current affairs uh, and and in some part of children's. How would you ensure and, that and there's sport, sorry. how would you ensure there's no deterioration in the ratios? Um, because I actually uh, believe that in-house production is really important for the BBC. Um, I think that the way it's been run organisationally, which is as part of television, has, um, doesn't match the world we now f uh, are in. And what I want for in-house studios is uh, creative leadership where um, uh, we can sell programmes not just to in-house but outside. And why does that make a big difference? It's this. Because if, if you were the con controller of BBC One and um, you've got an in-house uh, idea coming at you, but there's an indie saying, well, do you know what, I, I might take this to ITV, you, it's just possible that that controller might say, well, do you know what, I, I, I'll, I'll favour the indie. I just don't know. And what I want is for our in-house producers to have the same jeopardy that you do if you're outside. Also, I kind of believe 
in uh, the ability of our people inside when they're freed up uh, to compete. And I, th I kind of believe in competition. And I think the best idea should win as the indie sector and the growth of the indie sector of the last uh, decade or two has shown. I would love the same ability uh, for our in-house producers. And, and they are really good people. I believe in them. And I think this is the way of securing in-house production program making uh, in the BBC for the future. The, we've been talking very much about aspirational, uh, the aspirational future with the BBC, but looking at the current strategy of the BBC, what is the BBC's current strategy for developing the creative industries in Scotland? Um, perhaps Mr McCoy wants to... We're working, uh, um, working with Creative Scotland. We're also participative in, in a, an ongoing group that is uh, looking at what the right arrangements for the screen sector is in Scotland. So in all of these groups, we have an ongoing dialogue with Creative Scotland, with the industry, uh, with the producers in Scotland that's absolutely participative as far as that's concerned. Uh, that's similarly in terms of training, uh, we work very closely with the bodies that deliver training uh, in, and we're proud of the record that we have in terms of both uh, developing apprentices, um, providing um, introductory courses you know, within the BBC and making the whole of the training uh, of the BBC Academy available to uh, whether that's the independent sector or simply the freelance sector in Scotland. So. We're proud of that sort of work, Mr. Vitia. We, we work as actively and proactively as we can with the various players in that regard. You, you were talking there about trainees and apprentices. Um, obviously, you have quite a number of these employed by BBC Scotland. How many of them actually find employment in Scotland, ultimately? And is it correct that uh, a disproportionate number gravitate towards London? That um, we have good record in finding employment for the apprentices in Scotland. Um, some gra gravitate towards London, some come back. It's a very mobile uh, workforce, but um, in terms of the exact number that, of, uh, in terms of a percentage, uh, we're happy to look at that for you, but historically that's been something that has worked well for us. I'm seeing the figures on that one. We, we, should, we should give the figures. I mean, one of the things that I, I <coughs> strongly believe is, is, a, is, a, is apprenticeships. Uh, when I arrived at the BBC, because in my previous life, I'd done a, a lot of work with the Skills Council, which I set up uh, for that. Uh, what was interesting was uh, when you, I, I said I'd like to get to 1% of the workforce of the BBC being apprentices by the end of the charter period, end of this year, 2016. In fact, we got there by, uh, I think, the end of, uh, of 2014. And the, the, the really important thing with apprentices for me is that they are also locally based. So uh, forgive me referring to England, but in England, apprentices attached to local radio stations <laughs> means you then uh, have people being trained who can't afford to uh, go to London or a big city, are able to live at home, uh, are part of the locality, and that's been really successful. But again, but we'll, we'll, we'll give you the, 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 the rates for uh, what happens to those when they're through. But I want to continue with that apprentices, uh, apprenticeship schemes, uh, all the apprenticeship schemes. I think it's really important for the BBC, and important for the apprentices. Just, just turning to the Charter, sh should the Charter actually specify the BBC's role in supporting the talent and skills across uh, the creative industries in Scotland? Yes. And Very, if, it sh sorry. if it does... <coughs> How would you measure that? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very supportive of the amendment to the purposes of the BBC to uh, include uh, the uh, creative, uh, being part of the creative industries uh, as, as part of our role. And then I, have, I think you have to measure, you look at uh, value added, you look at the contribution to the economy, uh, and, and we need to work out, you're completely right, Mr Beattie, ways of being able to demonstrate that, uh, you know, without per adventure. What, what, would you, what would be a measurement of success? I think one of the me measures for me, apart from employment, apart from all sorts of other things we've been talking about this morning in terms of the quality and amount of output, would also be uh, you know, the value you bring, you, you bring to the creative economy. Uh, and I'm very struck, for example, from Liverpool City of Culture onwards by the analyses which demonstrate a pound spent brings in uh, another four or five. One of the, the, the things I, 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 I hope we can, again, build... Um, on is what BBC Films does. Uh, BBC Films I love. They do some remarkable work um, nurturing talent, bringing relationships together and bringing in funding. 
we put in a pound and we bring in four to five pounds. And I think that sort of demonstration of the, uh, the, uh, the, the importance that the BBC can bring to the creative economy is, is really important. And as Ken just said, um, I, I want the BBC in its open way, in its partnership way, to be working with the creative economy in Scotland to help, uh, to help deliver what I know you want. Um, just one last question about how are you going to respond to the calls that uh, are being received for parity between your in-house production for BBC Alba and that for S4C in Wales? Well, we met with um, BBC Alba yesterday uh, and had a very interesting uh, conversation with them and there are some budget issues that we want to resolve. Um, where we got to, uh, well, I'm kind of saying this, but I, I, of course, the, the, you know, the, the, they must say it too, is um, I want us to have a, a kind of a creative uh, review of where we are with, 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 with Alba uh, and, and uh, see what we can do together to build on the partnership we've already got and I think it's a really good partnership and I think uh, we obviously need to see how we can take that to the future. One of the thoughts which has came up to me watching uh, Bannan over the uh, weekend is also how we can see whether there are things, this all depends on contracts and all sorts of other stuff, but there are things which uh, Alba is doing which can link in more um, with what the BBC is doing overall. So Bannan is one of those things which, uh, you know, my own view is should have a, uh, an outlet across the whole of the UK, not just on Alba. Um, uh, but equally, what, what Alba is doing on music, I think, is again something we, we should be building on. I'm very keen that, the, um, that BBC Music is a brand, is something which is in the DNA of the BBC and all the things that we do, and we find ways of aggregating that uh, for our audiences in the future. And obviously, I think BBC Alba's got some, some important role in that too. So the answer is we've got a conversation, and I hope we can move that forward. Uh, John. Very quickly, convener. I'm not too sure if, if maybe I picked you up wrong, but of the apprentices, you take on 10 apprenticeships every year, and uh, are they actually trained in London? And if, if that is the case, are they any based uh, apprentice journalists in Scotland? They're, they're based, their apprentices are based in Scotland, um, and uh, we work um, with uh, other tertiary education providers you know, to ensure they get uh, a formal uh, accredited training. Do any of these be apprentice journalists or anything like that? Um, some of them have aspirations to be journalists and they, get their, they go, rotate through the uh, BBC on a variety of placements so they can find themselves working in news, they can find themselves uh, working in factual or education. They rotate round on that sort of basis. Can I just add, Mr Pennant, we've also been working uh, away from apprentices, working on a, um, a big initiative called Make It Digital, which actually came from... Um, a conversation I had with some uh, big tech companies who were saying there are three languages uh, you need to know in the world in the future. One is English, one is Chinese, and the other is coding. And, you know, Britain needs to get much better at coding, and I think we'd all uh, ag ag agree on that. Um, and as part of that, we've taken on uh, uh, digital trainees, uh, both some within the BBC and outside as well. Uh, and I think that, again, is the sort of thing which, uh, you know, BBC working in an open way with others can help do because you know we all know that coding and uh, digital digital literacy is uh, absolutely essential to the future of our economies. Just finally, uh, can be done. with regards to the obviously the amount of money that Scotland pays into the pot overall, uh, do you think proportionally that we get enough back to train apprentices? I think um, in terms of the overall. Uh, I think you can, it's something that I believe passionately in. I don't think you can ever, uh, to the future of a digitally skilled workforce, it's an important issue. It's always something that I think we need to keep under review to make sure we have the right number of placements, the right spend, uh, and the right, but also critically, the right training so that we have um, a workforce that's fit for a digital world. Um. Thank you. Mary? Yes, it was just uh, on the BBC, uh, looking at the portrayal of the BBC in the uh, different nations. I do notice in your submission that uh, there's a higher figure uh, percentage in Scotland consuming, if that's the word, BBC TV each week compared to uh, UK-wide, and that's for BBC One, Two, Three, and we're equal for four. Um, I also noticed figures we got last week from the BBC Trust uh, in terms of uh, audience appreciation, there was less than 2% between the different nations. Nothing really to talk about. But the one thing that really jumped out at me was um, the 
BBC Radio Reach in Scotland is 57% compared to 76 in Wales. Is there something wrong with the, or something that could be improved in the BBC infrastructure in order to increase that reach? Um, it's well below the national average. I'm sorry, I can't answer that if it's uh, in the infrastructure. It's but not, I, it's I, a distribution. It's not a distribution, is it not? Okay. No. Well, right, my question but, but, is... But, but let's check that it's not a distribution. It's just that in the absence of the BBC Trust coming, I yeah. thought you're only going to get appreciation if you've got the reach, obviously. Yeah, yeah. No, compl compl completely right. OK. Uh, I just want to, you know, to ask you, is the BBC keeping pace with the changes in Scotland? I mean, the pace of devolution is increasing by the day. And, uh, you know, the figures that we have here in front of us is that the portrayal and the perception and the appreciation, the acceptance of the BBC is pretty similar in each nation of the United Kingdom. Uh, do you feel you're keeping pace with devolution and do you feel that your, the appreciation of your audiences in Scotland is equal to uh, that of the rest of the UK? I mean, obviously I'm, I'm you know, d you know d delighted that, you know, um, uh, only 88% a figure that we talked about earlier. Um, it's really interesting in the top 20 programmes, as you, as you correctly say, um, uh, five out of 20 are uh, Scots-made programmes and the, and the others are, you know, as it were, pan-UK uh, programmes, which is terrific. And the AIs, as you say, are more or less flat. No, I, 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 um, I hope I made clear in, in my opening statement that I think uh, in, in news and also in portrayal, uh, there is more to be done. So, uh, and that's what I... That, that's what I, 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 I strongly believe, um, and and how we do that uh, and what we do is, you know, in my mind. Done in Scotland, you mean to Scotland meet and to the UK and for the UK. Rest of the UK, but yes. you don't see any difference in the appreciation of the BBC by the Scottish audience compared to audiences elsewhere in the UK. That's I, what I, your I, figures I, are saying. I, I, I want to make sure that the uh, support we have for public service broadcasting, the support we have there in the figures uh, in Scotland, uh, uh, continues. And if I may, I, I, I perhaps I can write you a note on the. Uh, figures you gave me on reach for radio. Uh, I, I haven't given you right to the convener. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to. Have vi so I've just got. I've, I've got. Okay. I'm looking at the time, and I've got a number of people trying to get in. So I'm going to be very quick. Very quick one from Liam and then, and then Gordon. Yeah, just. I mean, you're responding obviously to, to um, questioning pressures um, that uh, are, are very evident in, in Scotland. I think you've alluded to, to similar pressures, perhaps in other regions within in England, and, and I dare say Wales and Northern Ireland uh, make a very similar case. I think within all of that, is there a risk that where the pressure isn't coming uh, in, a, in a global sense, in an international sense, where the audience there is more disparate, that in order to accommodate all of the things that um, you're perhaps having to take on board domestically within a UK context, that where things will get paired back is in terms of the, the world service and in terms of the international reach. Th thank you for the question, because also I, I, I might be just to add to something or correct something that was said by, I think, one of your, your, your witnesses last week. Um, I, I've made a, a, a strong argument uh, at the time of the uh, settlement in July that I wanted to come back on to, the, to the Chancellor on a number of points, one of which was uh, World Service, because uh, I believe very strongly that the UK together has a powerful voice, uh, soft power, I suppose you'd call it, uh, uh, to the globe, and World Service in particular. And um, I was very glad uh, I, I've been talking to the Chancellor, others have been dealing with the Treasury too, and I was very pleased to say that we uh, won an agreement from him for an extra 85 million, that is new money coming into the BBC because we made the arguments to the Chancellor, the Prime Minister and others about the importance of what, what the UK can offer globally uh, through World Service uh, as, uh, as, uh, as soft power. So that was a very separate arrangement to the ones we came to last summer. Okay. For that, Gordon? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, just getting back to the network TV numbers, um, I, I just wanted to ask you a, f a further, further couple of questions on that. The first one was, um, you said you, you'd spent some time reading through the submissions we've had, and I, I hope you had the opportunity to read the submission from Matchlight, because uh, I felt it was very important in how they, they felt the system was actually being manipulated. And uh, the, the, the comment that was submitted in the um, written submission from Matchlight said, 
A lift and shift producer needs to spend as little as 5% of a production's total budget in Scotland for 100% of that budget to be counted as Scottish and set against the nation's quotas. And I'm just wondering what your views are on that. The, uh, the, the definition um, is set out um, un, in regulation by Ofcom. And to qualify as Scottish, uh, a programme needs to meet two of three criteria. Um, it needs to have a substantial base in Scotland, which is, means usual place of employment for senior management. It has to have 70% of the production budget spent in Scotland, excluding on-screen talent, archive and copyrights. That's quite a high hurdle. And it has to have more than 50% of production talent based in Scotland. So the, who those looks at that criteria? Who, who sits that, down? Yes, exactly. So the, 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 that criteria... Um, is looked at at the point of commissioning by uh, an independent assurance mechanic within the BBC. It's subsequently looked at again at the end of the production process and it's subject to audit and review by Ofcom on a sample basis. So it's, it's not a without regulation. So it's and it's not given. the case mm -hmm. that every programme that begins as a, inverted commas, Scottish production ends as a Scottish production. So if, when the work is done... And, and those two of those three criteria aren't met, then it, it can't count as a Scottish programme, and it doesn't, and we take them out. You know, we're in a situation where we've given a fictitious uh, television programme. Can you give us an example, a live example, of uh, a programme that has been put against um, Scottish production where all of the spend wasn't spent in Scotland? In, in, I, I can't. Um, in order to meet the criteria to be counted as Scotland, you've got to hit two of the three. Um, we do have examples where um, programmes were... Information held? Is that information held about how you meet the criteria? Yes. Right. So you could write to the committee and say the following programmes, this, this particular programme had 35% spend in Scotland or this particular programme had 65% spend whole, in Scotland. This whole mechanic... Uh -huh. in terms of definition of independent, uh -huh. which we spoke about earlier, uh -huh. and definition of regional is, uh -huh. is, is the Ofcom title for it, is subject to a regulatory process monitored by But you just told me the our, numbers are available. ...our independent regulator. So we'd have to think about how right. we deal with all of this because this is material that comes... You said earlier on we need to remove the lack of clarity in this of subject, so I'm of asking you to remove the lack of clarity. Of course we do, but what, what I'm saying is this is not an unregulated process. Yeah. But let's see if we can... Let's see how yeah. we can help. Yeah. Right, because it would help us to understand whether this is a, a concern that we should be taking seriously, yeah. where the figures are being deliberately manipulated, or it, it is something that somebody has a concern about but doesn't stand up after there's been evidence. So it would be good for you actually to provide some clarity yes. on that. To, uh, to continue that, you know, we have a quota of 17%. Donald, I am very happy to help. The only point I'm making is there's an interrelationship with the regulator in this space, and we just need to yeah, think about that. how we handle that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, in terms of the quota of 17% that we have for the nations and regions, yes. should Scotland have its own quota? Um, Scot the, 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 it does, yes, yeah. and that target exceeds 8.7%. Right, but in, in and we, and regulation it says that. a grand total of 17%. Doesn't actually specify. Number, that 8.7% is a is, is is a number which I believe is referred right, to okay. in the account. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's up been wrong, exceeded. I no, yeah. no. But again, we can show uh, progress against that over the last. If we can sell you those figures, that would be helpful. The 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 Ofcom um, definition uh, should that be changed to reflect uh, ownership of IP and retention of profits? I'm to, sorry. Should the definition include another criteria test that determines who ultimately benefits from the profit of the production and also who retains the IP? The, the, the definitions used by Ofcom have been looked at again and again um, over the last 20 years. Uh, this is a mechanic that works very well. Um, has been, it has wor sorry, has worked across the industry for a long time. Um, moving into changing a definition has all sorts of unintended consequences. So if, for example, um, an independent production company were to be acquired by a US studio, then that would potentially alter its Scottishness if you, if you, if you did that, mm -hmm. which may or may not feel fair to the individuals concerned 
um, in that world. So there are a lot of different issues around um, changing definitions to, to deal with a potential concern A as opposed to potential concern B. Um, it, it, it's very um, tricky territory uh, and there's been a lot of debate about it as I've said over a number of years. M my own view is that the definition runs across the whole of the industry, it sits, we've had it for a long time, everybody understands how it works and best to try to make it work well. Okay. Can I just check, you, you, you've said the word regulation several times, it's not a regulation is it? It's not in regulations. What, which the, the no, off, of Ofcom, Ofcom can't make regulations. Oh, oh, sorry, Ofcom are the regulator. They who, are the regulator, but you've said that you've monitor. defined them as regulations, but they're not regulations. I mean, effectively, it's a formula that, that, that you, you, you're not enforced to adopt. You decide to adopt it. That's correct. We've decided to adopt that, but the definition of, of, yeah. of regional independent. Um, is, is established with of common science. Yes, it was the use of the word regulation. I'm, I'm so sorry if that's been confusing. Okay. But, it, but it's an industry wide. No, no, I accept that. It was, by, it was, by it was the use of the word regulation, to, which I think would per, perhaps give a, the wrong impression as to what it was. Okay, just so finally. The, 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 the point I was trying to get across is this is not a set of definitions used only by the BBC, which is not subject to any sort of scrutiny, it is. No, I understand. Just, just finally, Tony, if you don't mind. Um, clearly, the issue, I think, the thread that's been running through much of last week and, and, and this week's discussion has been about the amount of autonomy um, that BBC Scotland has uh, and our interest in the future of the success of BBC Scotland um, and it's the importance of BBC Scotland to the creative industries and to the wider economy of Scotland. And I just wondered um, if you could outline for us your view on the idea that there should be further devolution um, of the BBC to BBC Scotland? Well, um, I start off um, by the principle of, and I think we got into uh, you know, whether service licence agreements means anything to anyone, but I, I, I feel very strongly that um, uh, those services uh, which are for Scotland, the nature of those services, the amount of money in the envelope that is agreed across the BBC for those services, that those services uh, should be uh, nurtured, um, the performance should be assessed, uh, the uh, change is if there are to be any changes within those services, the balance of those services, you were talking earlier on about news versus comedy versus drama within Scotland, all those things should be determined uh, within uh, Scotland. I think there is then um, uh, another set of relationships which is how we can work most effectively under a unified board if that's where we're heading and you know other people will make their minds up about that, not me then how we can ensure that the voice of Scotland uh, is properly represented on the, at the pan-UK and global level through the board of the BBC. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to get, perhaps you're not going to answer this, but I'm trying to get you to answer what degree of autonomy, effectively, you believe BBC Scotland should have in the future. Well, um, I'm, I'm maybe, maybe the, 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 worst, the use, use of the word autonomy is, is what I'm finding difficult to define. It's a bit like sort of federal well, difficult to define. Well, I would I'm like trying to avoid the word federal here, yeah. but I'm, trying, I'm also trying to suggest that effectively, at the moment, there isn't sufficient um, devolution uh, uh, of budget and commissioning and et cetera, et cetera. I want uh, the director for Scotland, as indeed the director for Wales, but we're in Scotland, the director for Scotland, to have uh, more power to decide the services that the people of Scotland want for Scotland. I also want the Director of Scotland to have a powerful voice uh, in determining what the BBC does as a whole, because I really do believe that there are things which the BBC together can do uh, nationally uh, in Scotland, nationally across the UK and globally as well, and I want that voice to be heard. Can I thank you very much and also thank Ken and Anne for coming along this morning. We do appreciate your time and coming to the committee. It's very, very welcome. Um, but I'm going to suspend briefly before we move to the next panel. Thank, thank you, Davina. Thank you.
Can I now uh, move us on to our next panel this morning, uh, or this afternoon now, I should say. Um, can I welcome Fiona Hislop, Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Europe and External Affairs, and her accompanying officials. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, apologies for the delay, uh, so, but thank you for waiting. Uh, and can I uh, invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement? Uh, thank you. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, Karina, and thank you for the opportunity to appear uh, before you today to discuss this important matter. I'm very pleased to be able to contribute to the Committee's inquiry and to build upon the written and oral evidence you've previously uh, considered. The BBC is a hugely important cultural institution and our interest in its future uh, is an interest rooted in the strongly held belief that public sector uh, broadcasting is a vital part of our social democratic, cultural and, demo and uh, democratic economic life. Uh, and I believe that it's time for the BBC Scotland to be empowered and resourced to be bold and creative for Scotland. Uh, the Scottish Government is proposing a federalised BBC that would allow BBC Scotland to control decision making within Scotland and I stress independent of government in order to strengthen and grow the industries uh, and Scotland's creative sector. Uh, I believe this would be a win-win for viewers in Scotland, but also uh, for viewers across the rest of the UK. Uh, and I am keen to work in partnership with the BBC to achieve this, both within and without the uh, charter renewal process, uh, because we should all appreciate that there is much that the BBC can do outside the charter renewal to improve its service to the people of Scotland. I want to be clear, it is not about some desire to control the BBC and to dictate what kind of services are delivered. This is about ensuring the BBC's long-term future in a way that benefits both the BBC and which benefits Scotland. It is a future that cannot be deemed to be meeting the needs of the UK's nations and regions unless it thinks about Scotland in a different way. And we've worked hard with stakeholders from Scot across Scotland to understand the issues and to develop a position that we believe has support and credibility. And I thank those that have engaged with us on the quality and thoughtfulness for the contributions as well as for the time. And our ask is simple uh, and it's widely shared. We want the BBC to be structured in a way that re better reflects the needs of the nations and regions it serves. A federal structure which empowers BBC Scotland to take full control over decision making in terms of how revenue that is raised and here is spent. Full control over commissioning and editorial decisions would have an enormously positive impact and would enable BBC Scotland to take a long term strategic approach to delivering the sustainable high quality programming for the benefit of Scotland's diverse industries and audiences <coughs> and the UK's audiences themselves, the global market and the creative sector. And this can also support additional digital platforms with content from Scotland, which could lead during the new charter period to new digital TV and radio channels. And with this in mind, I very much welcome the recent publication of the figures uh, setting out how BBC Scotland spends its resources. It's hugely helpful to have those figures as they help to inform the ongoing conversation the Scottish Government is having with the BBC. Uh, I followed the previous evidence sessions and indeed the one you've just had uh, in this inquiry and uh, with, with interest and of course I also have been involved in and uh, considered the work of the Energy, Enterprise and Tourism Committee which expressed its views on the value of BBC spend for creative and economic impact in Scotland earlier in 2015. So I look forward to discussing all these issues with you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we will try and be, keep the questions brief and hopefully the answer is reasonably brief as well so we can get through as much as possible this morning Cabinet Secretary. You have heard this morning I asked um, Ken McQuarrie and Tony Hall about um, the BBC Scotland plan I believe unanimously supported by BBC Scotland management team that was put forward um, for the future of BBC Scotland. Um, are, first of all are you aware of that plan and the detail of that plan and, and what's your view of it? Well I am aware that there was a, a view and uh, expressing a plan to uh, the BBC at network level that uh, a way forward for Scotland to be bold and ambitious and to be able to take a strategic lead in all of these different aspects of economic creative impact and indeed serving audiences as they really must must, must do was that they would have an additional uh, television channel but also um, radio content as well I mean there's a big challenge even on radio and a lot of focus is on, on television um, and that itself would have been you know, an extremely uh, positive step forward my understanding is that the restrictions uh, you know, imposed in in terms of 
budget settlement uh, in relation to the UK government in terms of licence fee for over 75s had meant that they withdrew or, or, or pulled back from that pr proposition. So what we're proposing is not something that is somehow alien or different from the ambitions within Scotland, the issues of capability that they can uh, can produce with the resources that they have, but it's perfectly possible even with transfer, transfers of existing resources to be ambitious for Scotland in terms of decision making, commissioning um, and economic and creative impact. Uh, but the, the idea of having an additional channel is one that you know this parliament has supported previously in terms of the Broadcasting Commission and digital channels, so uh, it's disappointing that that did not see the light of day in terms of the proposition put forward the BBC when they went into charter renewal process. Okay, thank you. Um, can I begin with Gordon MacDonald, please? Thank you so much, Convener. Um, I just wanted to ask about whether you felt that um, Scotland got a, a good deal out of the £323 million pounds of licence fee. Um, RTE has uh, four channels and four radio stations for €312 million, Euros, which equates to £234 million. Pounds. And Professor Blaine last week said the Republic of Ireland has a smaller population in Scotland, so if we are looking at what is imaginable, Ireland provides a good model and goes on to say, I have no difficulty in proposing the Irish model as one that we should look at, at least in an interesting way. I mean, what, first of all, can I just congratulate the committee on the work you've done already in, in you know, eliciting more concrete information from the BBC in terms of its spend in, in, in Scotland. I think there are still questions as to what is above the line and uh, below the line, what is overhead, what is creative content for Scotland and what is uh, commissioned in terms of uh, the UK that benefits Scotland, but what you know, the, the balance is. But you're absolutely right in terms of the, you know, the value we get from the BBC is very strong. Uh, nobody's questioning in terms of the, uh, the quality of, of many of the productions. Uh, but in terms of the range of um, services, in terms of number of channels and the number of um, uh, stations, uh, whether you look at Ireland, whether you look at Finland, if you did indeed look at the German model, if you look at other uh, models, actually you can have more distribution. And I think one of the key things in this debate, and I was listening to Tony Hall very carefully, he was talking about the importance of... Um, providing more online platforms. I think you know, the very least we can agree on is more online platforms for Scotland. But it's not just about how you access um, and how you, uh, what you, how you want to watch it. It's what you want to watch and it's content as well. So it's not just about the number of channels, absolutely. It's also about the quality of the content that you see. And I, I think we need to be approaching both. But in terms of value, other countries seem to get better value in terms of number of stations and number of channels than we do in Scotland. But we need the balance of both access in terms of channels, whether it's online or, as we would argue, additional channels or indeed... Um, um, the content, because we do need to make sure that it's the content that has the impact as well, whether it's creative content or economic impact. But would it be beneficial to Scotland if, if there was a separate licence agreement for Scotland, which changed the balance? The, the BBC Scotland's figures highlighted that a large proportion of its output was news, current affairs and sport, and a very small proportion was no, you know, drama, entertainment, comedy. Do we need something within the licence agreement with the BBC that, you know, puts a certain bar on how much that should actually be produced? Ab absolutely. If you look at the BBC's cu you know, cu their current consolidated accounts, if you look at the lines for Scotland, all you've got is BBC Radio Scotland and uh, Radio Nangale. We've got two radio stations. That's the only mention in terms of the allocation. And I think one of the things going forward, not just about the charter renewal, but the accountability between the Parliament particularly and BBC is to be able to break down what that content is. And I think setting that out is really important. That's where, yes, the service levels agreement is, is useful but it's not essential in how we change the overall impact of spend in Scotland. The service, you know, it makes sense to have that, but don't see that as the be-all and end-all in terms of charter renewal. And in terms of some of the figures that I've, I've heard, I thought it was very helpful to hear from Anne Bulford that she confirmed that £35 million is cash spend above the line uh, to spend on you know, commissioning, creative commissioning. Um, and then there's obviously a, an amount somewhere, but we don't know, we need to dig into this, and we can do that, you know, that, that can be done offline if necessary, between the £74 million that they say they're spending, a lot of that will be on overheads 
um, abs you know, it's about running the show. So therefore, in terms of um, the aspects also, I think you know, the, the point that was raised in questioning by Mark, I think it was, in relation to you know, how much was of the 323 is actually spent in Scotland. If Anne Bilford says 200 million is servicing the, the overall BBC, and she's talking about economic impacts, you've only got 123, of which some of that will be spent in Scotland that's actually coming back into commission, whether it's weakest link, no longer produce Waterloo Road, no, no longer produce. So I think the, the counting of this will be, be very important, but the charter, we need to think about what should be in the actual charter and what the expectations is in terms of um, the, the actual overall strategic thinking should be in the Charter, the accountability to Parliament, Mary Scanlon's point about um, the Audit Committee and also this committee about how we can get underneath this and, and what the impacts are. The service level agreement, I think, goes without saying. It's not there now. I think it's really important. It's part of the governance aspects, but actually um, it will help elicit information. But it's not just... It's not just the numbers, but it's the impact. And I think that's where the committee itself, the Parliament, will be very helpful. And as, indeed, the previous the Enterprise and Tourism Committee was about the economic impact of the spend as well. It's what we can contribute, not just what we can get. I think that's the important tenor of this debate um, here in Scotland. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Mark? Uh, thanks, Camina. Uh, just to go over those, those figures and to put some of the questions that I put to the, the previous panel to yourself, that the BBC figures... Um, suggest that licence fee income from Scotland is £323 million. Um, spend in Scotland, um, whether that's uh, network costs for uh, Waterloo Road or the other productions that are across the network, and the, the local content is £200 million, which leaves a contribution to the, the UK services that we benefit from of £123 million. And if, if you're talking about a, a Scottish Government preference for a, a federal structure for the BBC, um, how much of that um, federal BBC Scotland budget um, at the outset would be taken up by um, procuring, purchasing um, the, the programmes that uh, the vast majority of the time of viewers, 88% of the time, are spent watching? dollar question and, and that's exactly what we've been working with the BBC to try and elicit and your, your committee has been very helpful at getting these uh, figures out in the public in terms of what, you know, what these figures look like. Obviously in terms of you know, programmes like Doctor Who, Sherlock um, are seen by you know, uh, countries across the world. You know, if you look at uh, Sky Virgin in Ireland you know, they get that and you, in terms of the, the premium in terms of the contribution it's very I think it's about one euro we can look into that in terms of per household so in terms of the actual spend of course you'd want a commission you know, you'd be paying into in a federal system you'd be paying into the overall pop for issues whether it's a uh, you know UK worldwide etc and indeed some of that programming I think has also was expressed I think by by George in your previous George Adam in your previous session actually producing some of the big shows drama shows not just quiz shows and um, uh, you know, ever much that can provide jobs for you know for, for crews etc but but um, you know, drama is where you'll get your big recurring spend in terms of developing um, the industry. So yes, I, uh, you know, I, I want to be able to, to see that. But you know, in terms of creative impact of original television content for Scotland, as confirmed by Anne Bulford today, of 35 million out of a budget of 323 million, that's not a bigger economic creative impact that we need to see in Scotland. So we need to have that shift. And yes, there would be contributions that would go back in in terms of that overall spend, but to do it in that way around, and I think you know, certainly this committee in looking at the accounts to determine, okay, what is overhead spend for um, the UK? What is what is necessary here? And you had, I, mean, I think that's the challenge because what we haven't got is the economic impact of network spend, network for network commission programmes here in Scotland. I think the convener tried to get that from Ken Macquarie in your questioning, but he was referring back to local spend, not the, the other impact. So, uh, you know, as Anne Bulford saying that it costs, in a federal structure, it would cost £200 million for, for to get all the services that we get from the UK. I'm not so sure about that. Now, I can't give you, because I'm not in charge of the BBC accounts and the budgeting, I'm in probably in a similar place to you as trying to get in and around this, but we're in a very good place now because of the work of the committee to be able to have that dialogue with the BBC. And my intention is to, again, meet with BBC at UK level, Tony Hall, and indeed BBC in Scotland, to be able to, to, to identify what those figures would look like. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that figure for what it would cost to buy in is, is probably um, key. That's the, the figure that then 
um, sets out if, it, if it's actually worthwhile, if there's any but, uh, financial benefit to move into a federal structure. I think you've got to differentiate two things. Buy-in programmes. So, for example, RTE will buy in Sherlock and Doctor Who. I think you know, it will be in the range of tens of millions for what they have to provide um, to, to make sure EastEnders, all those programmes are seen. Now, what we're saying is that the value of the BBC is not just in the consumption of programmes, um, like EastEnders or Sherlock, etc. It's actually in, in, create, in being able to have a sustainable production system. And what for a strong, bold, creative, ambitious BBC, we've got to make sure that you know you had the what was it uh, Tony Hall said that he thought the charter, and I agree with him, the charter itself should have part of the BBC's role is their part of their role is to support creative industries. Now I agree with that. The issue is. Um, how much of that is being supported in Scotland currently and under the current system when as the Enterprise and, and uh, Tourism Committee identify themselves, and I think this committee has looked into this as well, you're not getting the same impact. So by, by, by moving decision making and some budgets, I'm not saying what well, I would like to see all of the budget transferred and then something remitted back in for the central services, but even in a federal structure to come to some agreement of what it's the transfer of decision making and commissioning to BBC Scotland that will enable that, that impact, to, not so that we can have good quality programmes, not just for now and next year, but actually building, building the industry for the future. Because the, the danger we've got is that if you're talented and you're able and you want to be a producer, you're a series editor, etc., your career choice means you have to move to London. And that's not going to be good for the BBC in the long run, even across the UK. We've got to make sure we've got that industry. So. I know a lot of this is about the accounting of the immediate spend, but the strategic interest in the BBC Charter renewal has to be about shifting the impact of decision making and commissioning. And I think across my discussions, all the different stakeholder sessions that we've had, that is where people have got a consensus. And I've seen that also from um, um, the other committee's inquiry as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liam. Thank you, uh, convener. The, in response to Gordon MacDonald's question about um, RTE, I, I I think I heard you right in suggesting that they um, appear to get better value in the number of channels that they have. Now, that tells us about a, a quantity, but not necessarily a quality. And I think one of the concerns that's been raised in relation to, to what happens in Ireland is there's an awful lot of bought-in content from the US, uh, which comes at a, a high cost and has also led uh, to a flight of talent from Ireland um, to other parts of the UK. Is there not a risk that we get hung up on, on quantity and, and, and lose sight of the issue of quality here? If you listen to my answer to, to, to Gordon, I, I deliberately stress that this is not just about the range of platforms, it's also about the quality of the content. And I agree with you that, that it has to be both. And that's, but you, you can only guarantee the quality of content if you're reinvesting in the capability of the sector itself. And that's what, although you know, there's great things happening in Scotland, there's a real risk that we're not producing as much in Scotland in terms of the creative content as we can and should do to do exactly that. Otherwise, if it's just buying in, that's not good enough. Just to buy in programmes um, isn't good enough. And I think if, but if you look at what Tony Hall also said, he said building an online channel is important. Now, I agree with him, right? But it's not just about, as he was talking about, windows to access. It's not just about how you access. It's not just windows and of, of, of different platforms to access. It's actually the content behind it. And I think you know, the idea that Scotland can't produce quality content drama is ridiculous because we have got good, you know, we've got um, good experience. But if you look at what's coming out of Scotland currently, even for the network commissioned, even for the network commissions by the Indies, a lot of it's factual. It's very good, excellent. We've got a great reputation. A lot of it's children's. We've heard it's a lot of it's game shows. But actually, we need to make sure that we've got that broad range of quality, as you said, to make sure that we can produce that. So uh, if you, the only way you can uh, guarantee it, because we've tried quotas, I'm not saying that there hasn't been an economic impact by quotas and lift and shift. It's just a different type that we might necessarily need for sustainable production in Scotland going forward. But um, the issue there is is actually trying to just make sure that we've got the, the, you know, the quality of, of, of what we need from that. And I think that's, that's going to be the real issue. Now, you know, I think in terms of what I've heard this morning, there's a lot of consensus actually about what we're trying to achieve. The issue is how do we get it? And, and although you've had quotas, it's the decision-making and commissioning would be the big difference. Now, Tony Hall said that he, his, his answer was about, to your questions, was about access to commissioners. What we're saying is actually you need the commissioning here 
Now, not all of the Commission, and, and yes, it's got to operate within a federal model, we, we recognise that. Um, uh, and it, you know, people might feel uncomfortable with federal aspects, decentralised, you know, we, we might be ahead of the game in a lot of this, it might be decentralised approach and decision making, but the, the power and the influence follows the money. And if you don't have control of the budgets and you don't have control of commissioning, you won't be able to have the, the creative content, the quality content that you want to see. He also said that the, um, I think four of the commissioners um, are actually uh, based out of uh, Scotland. It's not simply a, a, an access uh, issue. Uh, to be fair, you referred um, to uh, The Weakest Link, a show no longer on, uh, similarly Waterloo Road. You, uh, it appeared as if you were somewhat dismissing uh, the, the, the impact that those had. Now, I understand that The Weakest Link, for example, yeah. the specialist skills that have arisen from that have led to then a subsequent commission for that team through commercial television. So I, I, while I, I, I understand um, your, your desire to see more for example, drama uh, commissioning. Um, there is going to be a finite budget here, and, and, and more of something um, is, is potentially going to lead to, to less of something else. I mean, I, I, when Waterloo Road was commissioned here, um, I welcomed it because I did know that that would you know, help with the skill base in Scotland and, 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 and recognise that. Uh, but in terms, therefore, of the the, you know, the the issues, I'm not sure if the company that produced that is still you know, still has a, an office in Scotland or whether that's they've now you know, what, you know what activity they're doing. It's probably worth looking into that to see where that, where that is. I'm not saying there isn't an economic impact. What I'm saying is it's not at the level that would now an now originated Scottish material. Otherwise, it's you know is the lift and shift. So there is a, there is an economic impact for lift and shift, but it's limited. Yes, it provides us you know back to absolutely right in terms of the evidence they gave you in terms of jobs for you know crew and for um, perhaps assistant producers or researchers but if you even look at the Ofcom quotas and I think it's worth looking again you know BBC voluntarily administered the Ofcom quotas to get the, you know because obviously Waterloo Road weakest link etc would count towards the nine percent of, uh, of of you know Scottish pro you know you produced material but you know the Ofcom quotas themselves are outside the M25 now you know, I thought Tony Hall didn't necessarily answer your question about how their definitions were in terms of what is Scottish um, and it's the senior decision making it's a bit like branch economies you know in terms of recognizing if you've got something that's headquarters in Scotland um, you not only do you have the immediate economic impact of the jobs in terms of um, whether it's um, you know uh, editing or, or well I'm not sure if editing would be done in Scotland of um, particularly in the crew base and the sound engineers etc but the big Im economic impact it comes back to where the future is and this is why the BBC Charter has to be strategic is about how we can get better value out of exports how do we make sure in terms of online productions co-productions with other companies it's that skill base and that experience that a lot of the companies that are um, you know conducting the lift and shift have with their headquarters based in London, but that's the that's the experience that we're not getting in Scotland, and that's what we have to try and shift. So, I, I mean, I think. Oh, okay, uh, I, I mean, I'll I think the I, I think the, the point that was also made was that um, if we're not careful, the unintended consequences of, of, of shifting in terms of a um, a, a Scottish-based or Scottish-owned uh, company is that you get a change in the, the market, which sees a company bought out by a by a, by a I don't know a London-based company or a US company, uh, and suddenly um, a whole series of people who have a set of skills and and, and, are, are, and are based in Scotland and feel themselves very Scottish uh, are, are considered out with uh, whatever mechanism that, that you. To, to, to describe these things, so that um, there are real risks in, in, in tartanising this in a way that, that simply does not keep pace with what is happening within the, within the marketplace. It's got, to be, it's got to be sustainable, and we've got to look at global markets, absolutely, but you know, as somebody who represents a West Lothian constituency that's seen NEC and Motorola come and go, if you look at the parallels of inward investment, it's a bit like Waterloo Road, it takes something, uh, and, then, and that, all those jobs then move because of uh, you know, that one programme. So if you've got one big big network programme perhaps as you know was indicated coming to the end end, end of its lifespan that's not necessarily as sustainable as homegrown in turn and sort of developing businesses that can be global can be export based can be selling into markets and part of this is the confidence and the capability of the Scottish content to be one you know to, to be of quality that can add into the mix and you know there's two things there's the economic creative in, impact but it's also about the BBC being and it, they know the challenges in itself and, and in Indeed, the consultation from the UK government is how do you get that diversity of, of perspective? And if, you're, if your commissioners, by and large, have got a, a similar mindset and a similar experience, then you're not going to get the quality and range. And what's interesting in the global area, and how do you, how do you plan for five, ten years? You've got a charter of ten years. How do you plan for the future? 
the um, the originality of, of content um, in a global market has you know, ha, you know, has currency, and you're seeing that with the Scandinavian broadcasts, and a lot of production is going to be co-production in the future, and you know we need to make sure we've got a sustainable base for that, and I think the role of the BBC is not in just in consuming or providing immediate consumption for, for audiences. It's about being a leader in how do we make sure the sustainability for five, ten years' time. And I think you know how, how, how it has an impact on creative industry in Scotland is absolutely critical. And we haven't got that balance right yet. So I'm not saying lift and shift, you know, it was, it was necessary perhaps at the time to get the figures and the numbers, etc. But it's a different type of qualitative um, production in Scotland that we're looking for uh, going forward. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a brief supplementary on this, then we move on to governance. Yeah, just, well, just, yeah, links too. Uh, and, and, you know, thank you for mentioning global markets, the, the customers, because we seem to not have discussed that this morning. Uh, and while we've had numbers, um, you know, I think it's clear that some people are not quite on top of the numbers that they have uh, or should have. Uh, in terms of, you use federalism, I, I'd be cautious about that, but. Um, I, I raised the question about why doesn't BBC Scotland be its own company entity, accountable, you know, measuring performance, you know, productivity, efficiency, and creating creativity you know, as, a, as the main product and service. Why would we not talk about that as part, and it could be report to a unitary board so that policy is set, but the operation is quite clearly measurable, uh, achievable, and sustainable? Well, you know, I, I believe in public service broadcasting and, you know, I don't want to give any opportunity for the Conservative government to uh, privatise the BBC. Now, I'm not saying that that's what the plans are, but in terms of... That a statute, so it means. Well, you know, in terms of in terms of the structures, I think I think we've got to be very careful about making sure the governance model uh, fits in with public service broadcasting and doesn't allow an opportunity for private your privatisation. Well, I, I I heard Mary's concerns. I'm not suggesting the UK government is doing that, but I'm just saying that actually is part of that process. I think in terms of the um, the governance arrangements, and that's why the the Clementi um, uh, review, which is very imminent actually, and, I, and I'm due to speak to him tomorrow, is very important in the governance aspect. I mean. There's lots of things that need to be reviewed about the, UK, the BBC um, governance, but in particular, there's uh, you know the Scottish representation within that. Now, I do think in terms of a, a, a board setup that can work, but not in a way necessarily that leads it to a, a kind of marketised model. I think in terms of the accountability, um, it, it can be, and that's why I do think that there needs to be Scottish representation um, on that. And that I think actually, if you had more um, accountability both to this Parliament but also to a Scottish board. Um, that fed into a federal system within the UK, that would be a very good system for checks and balances. And I think it's the checks and balances because you don't want things to be overly on a marketisation for making profit because audiences, uh, you've got to think, you know, the point about consumers or in, the, in this case audiences. And, well, and, and the board would have the policy. Uh, exactly. And I think, and I think it's that, and I, I suspect that is the, the, the direction we're going in. Um, and it's just what we need to make sure, again, it's part of the role of this uh, of Parliament as well, is to make sure within that setup there'd be strong representation from Scotland. Right, I accept um, all that, but it has to be yeah. measurable and seem to be an yeah. entity that can and, be measured. And, that, and that's where you know, the separate service level agreement we talked about would allow that scrutiny mm -hmm. um, and accountability um, in many ways. But I think there's an issue about uh, where I think the board would be helpful um, is actually in the strategic ambition of what's happening, rather than just managing things on a, on a, on a, on a, a short-term basis. That's where I think the board could be helpful because it could take a more holistic mm -hmm. and over. That's that's yeah. quite agree with. Okay, thank you, um, Mary. I think uh, we have actually been fairly consensual on this. I think all of us round the table want the same thing for Scotland, so I will ignore the comment about uh, my colleagues down south. Um, can I can I just say uh, I, I was pleased that you did acknowledge and uh, you appear to be satisfied with the commitment to improving Scottish specific statistical information. I think we all need that in order for the audit committee, for this committee and for yourselves uh, going forward and also to ensure that the BBC Scotland is more accountable to Scotland uh, financially uh, but also in terms of service. But what really struck me was, given that there is a commitment to that information, um, that you've come in with a, a federal budget now, presumably a federal budget, does that mean a fixed sum given to Scotland every year, uh, etc.? Would that not be very difficult to negotiate at the moment, given that we 
truly do not have enough Scottish specific statistical information. It, you're right that it would at this moment in time, but even the movement in the last few weeks and months in terms of the publication of Scottish-specific information is enabling us to have that dialogue and discussion. And the issue then would be, to what extent would you then say, okay, in, in a federal structure, um, there would be agreement that the allocation to Scotland would be X, or would Scotland get all of the 323 million and then subvent, you know, like a, be a subvention back in for um, some of the kind of, uh, the, obviously the UK, uh, the UK wide uh, roles and responsibilities. Um, I'd like to maximise how much that is, but you're absolutely right. Now we've got the basis for that discussion, and although you know there's a. The, the, I, I do recognise what the BBC has put forward is in keeping with what the information that, that we have, but we've got far more openness and clarity, so we can genuinely have that discussion in a way that we wouldn't be able to have even six months ago. So the process of doing this has been very, very helpful. The memorandum of understanding given the audit committee and this yeah, committee, yeah. plus this information, I would just convene and be very concerned if we suddenly, in the absence of the information that we all need yeah. as parliamentarians to start looking at a federal structure. Just leave it there. Okay. Do you one. not want to ask your second question? Yes, I do, <laughs> given that you asked it. In <laughs> <laughs> and given that you chastised me for it. my second did. question. Um, well, it was really uh, about the, you know, the, the role of uh, autonomy. And um, it, it, I, I was quite interested, and I have no doubt that you've read the BBC submission. And it seems the audience appreciation for the BBC channels, for the weather, for sport, etc., they're very, very similar in Scotland uh, compared to the UK. In fact, uh, for TV overall, the figures in Scotland uh, are just 1% higher in consumption of BBC compared to UK-wide. But it was really to look at, uh, you know, to what extent given that we all know that devolution is moving apace now, you know, to what extent do you feel the BBC has kept up with the changing face of uh, Scotland in terms of devolution and how much further it should go in future? We've spoken about the degree of autonomy in terms of budget, etc. But how much more Scottish Scottishness are you looking from BBC Scotland in future, really to reflect uh, the increasing pace of devolution? Well, well as, as yeah, budget, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I think it's really important as a government minister that it, you know, I make it quite clear it's not my job to influence the content and the editorial decisions, all that. that there has to be independence in that. But um, I, I think it's a fair comment that the BBC, the BBC themselves have acknowledged that they haven't kept pace with devolution, which obviously started in 1999. I mean, they've acknowledged that themselves. And I think the challenge we've got in the Charter, which is we 10 years, possibly 11, I do think there's merit in trying to, to separate out elections and Charter renewal timescales. Um, but it, it, we've got to future-proof for 10 years' time. Now, we don't know where we'll be in, in 10 years' time, but Tony Hall himself acknowledged that actually the political um, developments in Scotland are asymmetrical, whether it's Northern Ireland, whether it's Wales, etc. Um, and that in terms of the capability of Scotland to be able to uh, make decisions uh, operationally within the BBC, we want to empower it. We, we think they can be empowered far more than they have just now. Now, I, I'm arguing that a federal structure makes sense in lots of different ways. I know other people say, okay, actually what you need is more decentralisation, which is more like devolution or enhanced devolution. And it could be different in Scotland than it is in Northern Ireland and Wales because our challenges are, are, are different. And actually, our devolution settlements are different. So I, I think there's a space to, to move in this. But we have to make sure, and I agree with you, that um, you know, he talked about an asymmetrical development within Scotland and they hadn't kept up. That Actually, there's, there's the scope and capability for changes in Scotland. And it's the changes that are needed. Um, and that's going back to Liam's uh, point that actually you can have a percentage figure, but if it doesn't allow keeping up in pace with you know, the cultural developments, etc. And we've got a very strong cultural base. And, you know, I know a previous director general um, had said to me that one of his regrets um, in relation to the Olympic coverage, that they did not have more creative cultural content because the cultural Olympic from Scotland, because the cultural Olympiad was so strong in Scotland, mm -hmm. that that would have added to the overall UK in terms of content. So I, I think there is a, 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 an embeddedness of, our, of, of how we do things in Scotland that is of quality. And it comes back to this. This is not just about platform and it's not just about channels um, and it's not just about spend, it's about impact and I think that's the bit that is a, yeah, no. Well, uh, right, Kavina, just, just a final point. Um, 
uh, and I think the audience appreciation figures illustrate that in Scotland, you know, we are very loyal to, to the to the BBC. We're certainly watching it in great figures. But all I wanted to ask about your federal model: Have you discussed this model with your counterpart in Wales, Northern Ireland, and in England? Because you couldn't just have a federal structure for Scotland without having a federal structure elsewhere. Is this something that uh, you know? Cabinet secretaries and the other nations have been discussing. I have had discussions with the culture ministers of Nor Northern Ireland and Wales. I've also met with John Whittingdale. I plan to meet him again, and you know he's aware of our you know, our work. I think the emphasis is has what can we achieve with the BBC? We can't do this in isolation, um, and that's why it's got to be in discussions with them. Now, um, I'm due to speak to again you know to speak to the to Wales and Northern, Northern Ireland uh, again fairly soon, but. I don't think it's dependent on that. I think you know we can share our views and what we can can offer, but you know, helpful to know. Yeah, they'd have uh, it, helpful to have, and 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 that kind of the, the point about content. I mean, the interesting thing is Wales does because of Doctor Who and other things. We actually have quite a strong and S four C a strong um, production base mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of commissions are from there whereas in Northern Ireland that isn't the case it's quite different you know, everybody's experiences are different I think the challenge that the BBC have themselves from their own audience research is that they are concerns about how the BBC reflects Scotland to itself and mm -hmm. um, some of that's the news and that can be dealt with separately from the BBC charter but also in relation to, to other content and, and to share that and, and I think that's what they'll have to they'll have to decide that themselves yes, I understand. But it, it, it's better that they, I think it'll be easier to do that if commissions are from Scotland and decisions yes. are taken from Scotland, which we can then share the great productions uh, with the rest of the audiences across the UK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, George Adam. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, some of the uh, individuals, Scots individuals, that the, the, the Director General mentioned that involved network television are examples of Scots who have had to go away from here. And it's back to your argument again about commissioning being based up here. Uh, last week we heard from Professor Blaine and Beveridge and Professor Beveridge both said that we should look at having a, an existing channel or a new television channel based here because it was all about commissioning it was all about how we deal with that now uh, Professor Beveridge went even further and said the BBC too should be just moved to Pacific's Key and he believed there was a plan that the BBC had looked at that at one point uh, to do that. Now the BBC already has history in doing that anyway because uh, Media City in Salford as an example where they moved BBC Breakfast, CBBC, BBC Sport and uh, also uh, BBC Radio 5 Live to that area and that they're saying over a five year period that could be worth about a billion pounds to that regional economy. Now is that not just an example the BBC have already done that kind of thing before? Is, it not, is there not a way we can actually find a way for them to do something as well so that we can all, because even Tony uh, Hawley self said he wants drama in particular to be more organic and actually coming from the area, not necessarily with tartan and shortbread on it from Scotland but actually you know, a Scottish drama you know, a Scottish science fiction show, a Scots uh, kind of show of some sort. You know, is, is that not the kind of radical way that Professor Beveridge said? Is that not the way forward for us? Well, there, there needs to be significant, uh, possibly radical change to the BBC to make the impact that you know, we, we really need both in the impact for creative and economic content for what the audiences want, but also to help the sustainability in the long term. So the, the issue is how do you do that? Now, we think uh, certainly having an additional channel um, you know, digital channel and also radio, because I think you know, there's a challenge there for speech and also music in the same channel, and how you can actually, you know, yeah, opportunities for to have both. I think where there's an agreement is that there needs to be additional online platforms for Scotland. Uh, that can be a channel. That can be that can be a channel. That can be a linear channel. It can also you can think about you can move into linear channel. You can also then have um, in terms of radio opportunities. But so the no, nobody's saying the status quo is satisfactory. Even the BBC are saying you know everybody's acknowledged that. So therefore, what is the change and what can it be? Um, you could try and do something internal within the, the within the BBC structure, and that's why moving the BBC two, for example, that was that pr proposition. But actually, you know, taking up the BBC three space where it becomes vacant with a new Scottish channel is an opportunity as another as, as another opportunity and it's the, it's the decision making about the content of commissioning the content which will drive that and that comes back to the point of being able to then have the quality content to put on there which we're capable of doing but if you don't have the budgets to do it and going back to Anne Bulford's evidence the budgets for decision making decision making 
and commissioning in Scotland are very, very small indeed, and nowhere near the 323 million, nowhere near even the 123 million that, that um, you know, Mark was referring to. So if your decision making is over a very small amount, you're not going to have that influence. And the consensus, this is why, you know, in terms of people have different views and opinions and your people are giving evidence to you will have different views and opinions. But the consensus opinion that's been built up over the next, you know, the last uh, period over the number of engagements we've had um, over a number of months um, has been that actually the kind of change in the decentralisation of decision making um, and commissioning to Scotland would make a huge impact. The federal structure is the logical um, end game of that, but again, that would depend across the UK, where, as, as Mary was saying, you know, where, where we've got Northern Ireland and Wales. But regardless of any of that, you can still have more decision making made in Scotland. So it's the empower, you know, if, if it's to try and describe what we're trying to achieve with the charter renewal, it's empowering the BBC, but it's also getting a bit of strategic thinking in there, and it's the strategic part um, that I think really will be the win for us. And it won't just benefit Scotland; it would actually benefit the rest of the UK as well. Thanks. Good thing. Can I just, I mean, I presume, Cabinet Secretary, you've seen and I imagine uh, the detail provided by uh, Matchlight um, in terms of commissioning um, and the Ofcom rules, which are the context for some of that, uh, those comments that they provided to us. And they gave a, an example, not a real example, but a, a worked example of how it can be the case that commissioning, which ends up as all of the, all being allocated as Scotland spend can be as little as certainly a single figure percentage in terms of actual spend. What's your view of the, the, the evidence we received on this area, not just from Matchlight but, but, from, but from others, uh, and also um, what are your view of, views of the uh, Ofcom rules? That yeah. Well, that? one, the BBC are voluntarily um, operating Ofcom and there might be an issue, but where, maybe there's a, an issue about what should go in the BBC charter. I'm not saying saying particularly that, you know, if you, well, it's a 10-year charter, um, so therefore you've got to have some scope for flexibility within that. But I, actually being firming up as to what that looks like uh, uh, is, is, is very important. <laughs> Um, in terms of the evidence that was provided by Matchlight, like very similar to the evidence given to the, you know, the, the, the other committee, the, the Enterprise and Tourism Committee, in terms of economic impact. Now, I'm not saying it, it, that there's no impact, because of course there is, I mean, and I, and, you know, I recognise that. But it's the, it's the qualitative aspect of that. And also, even within the Ofcom rules, or variations thereof, the, 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 the BBC Scotland, uh, or sorry, uh, network um, uh, commissioners are looking at, you know, it could be, if your talent is, you know, you, know, you can have talent outside the M25 as their rules. I'm not quite sure what the BBC you know, rules are in terms of Scottish residency and you know, how do they measure that and how they have an impact. But it, it's quite clear that I think Matchlight have got a point that we're not getting the same economic and creative impact as sustainability. And going back to my point is, you know, even if people have um, a branch office in Scotland, some of the issues where you can actually have the development of the industry, it's about the kind of those other aspects of global sales, it's about online aspects in relation to other, other companies in terms of intellectual property, where the intellectual property lies. For many of these examples, the intellectual property value does not lie in Scotland, even though they're called Scottish productions. And that's the, that's the shift that we need, we need to have. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, and I have too many people uh, have said to me, oh, we meet in airports, or, you know, it's the Monday I think you referred to, you know, people kind of come up for on a Monday, go back on a Friday, but, you know, their long-term investment in Scotland to the industry, they're not leading the industry particularly. They are having an impact, and I don't want to underestimate that how important it is, but actually, you know, I think that was the point. The answer you didn't get from Ken Macquarie was about how much of the decision-making for network comes from Scotland and how much is the spend of that, and I think that's the number of what we need to try and change. So I did try. I know you did. <laughs> I'm sure you might have follow-up. Um, I'm sure follow up on that. Yes, sorry, Liam. Yeah, I mean, we've we've returned to the figure of 35 million, which I, I mean, I, I accept BBC themselves were were in, in a sense substantiating. But I'm, I'm taken by um, a comment from Nicole Cleman of Firecrest Film, uh, specialising in, in current affairs and, and also works on the on the Panorama and Channel 4 Dispatches programme. And how she's quoted to say, "My feeling is that the value of television production in Scotland to the Scottish economy and to the Scottish viewer." is significantly more than 35 million. And uh, another executive 
commenting in the same article, um, uh, suggested we're using local companies, we're doing our editing here, I'm employing Scottish producers, assistant producers and journalists, doesn't that benefit the Scottish e uh, economy? Um, it, it's bizarre, it just doesn't make sense. The amount, the value of productions made here for the network is so much higher than that, referring to the £35 million. Now, I don't think necessarily we're ever going to be able to drill down into given the, the makeup of, of, of the way in which programmes are, are, uh, are, are produced and, and commissioned. Um, so is there, is there a, 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 a risk to some extent that what, we, what we're seeking to do is, uh, is create a definition of, of, of Scottishness which doesn't necessarily reflect what is happening uh, in the industry and undervalues some of what is already happening uh, at the moment in terms of productions? Uh, well, I, you said that we may never get to, to resolve it. I think we can. I think that's why Mary Scallon is quite right to say what we can do in terms of the accounting and, and the, what can be produced. Because even in the, the last few weeks, uh, this committee has elicited information that actually one confirms our figure that we've been using of the 35 million of original original TV content, not series production for Rika's Link or anything, original TV production um, for Scotland. That's now acknowledged by Anne, Anne Bulford. And then the issue is of the, uh, you know, is it underestimated? Well, I agree that actually there's more from you know, uh, in, you know, independent producers that are maybe doing network commissions for Panorama or else spend in Scotland. I'm not saying that there isn't an economic income impact. There is. The issue there is we've got, I think it's eight, uh, using the Anne Bulford's figures, £83 million pounds spent in Scotland and lift, uh, uh, you know, from, uh, including lift and shift. So the thing there is, but in terms of it's better to have a headquartered base that then can grow in the longer term rather than one-off commissions. Um, and that's, I think that's the difference. So I'm not saying that doesn't matter, but if you've got, um, yes, you've got sound engineers, yes, you've got assistant producers, but what you're actually wanting is the kind of the people who devise the programmes. Where's the intellectual property value of that? The intellectual property value of what a lot of these lift and shift companies um, are contributing is not remaining in Scotland. So there's got to be a better balance. Um, and I think everybody is saying that there has to be a better balance. Now the issue is how do you get that better balance? Um, Tony Hall is talking about access to commissioners. That's not necessarily going to be sufficient to get the better balance that we're trying, trying to achieve. And I think it's quite interesting that um, you know, since these figures have been produced by the BBC, and in, furthermore from their evidence today, they are backing up the figures that we've been using. Now, I don't have a fight about... I, mean, I, I think actually it's not necessarily going to be productive. Just to, I think we're now getting to a consensus even of what the figures are representing. I think we need to get a bit more c clarity and detail on it. But by and large, we've got an understanding of what that looks like. And the issue is how do you, how do you change network commissioning and budget and decision making and how do you do that for the benefit of Scotland but also the, within the context of the BBC the rest of the UK that is a win-win for both I think we can do that and I think there's a case for that and that's why I'm very pleased of, I've had constructive uh, discussions and a number of meetings with BBC Scotland management and also with BBC UK uh, management and will continue to do so but it's that you know so I, I think we're, we're starting to move into a ground where actually the, the areas of difference in terms of understanding the figures are not that are not that great. Thank you. Um, Colin, Colin, please. Thank you, Mayor. Cabinet Secretary, um, we've been talking about the creative industries, and in the context of the Charter, how is the Scottish Government, presumably in partnership with Creative Scotland, proposing to become engaged in setting the strategic direction for the development of broadcasting in the independent production sector? Well, well, first of all, I think the, the fact that there is a memorandum of understanding uh, with the UK government as partners, the Scottish Parliament, the BBC themselves is very important. Um, one of the things that I managed to persuade the UK government to, to amend was that the, U the Scottish government would be involved throughout the process, not just at the beginning or the end. Um, and also, within that, so for example, um, in relation to the consultation, I mean, this consultation on the BBC Charter has generated 200,000 responses, which I think is the biggest responses for any government inquiry ever what it looks like um, but we will engage with the, the UK government on the responses to that consultation but also in terms of what we can input to the content prior to the publication of the white paper and um, because the white paper will be part of the stages of this this process is the point about the impact on creative industries I think there's likely to be I, I may be wrong but a consensus with the UK government the BBC and ourselves that the 
um, the role of the BBC as being leaders to, to help lead in terms of the sustainability of the creative industries, not just for themselves, but for the wider sectors there. They've got to also be able to compete and have the opportunity to provide other areas. And the one thing in this uh, community is in the BBC studios, I, I think the jury's are, uh, very much out on this. I think it's something we have to revisit um, from a Scottish perspective and, and also from a UK perspective. But I agree with Tony Hall's point that there should be something in the Charter about the role of the BBC to lead the creative industries. I just don't think it should be measured or understood just at a, a UK level, because if you do that, then you'll ignore the impact in Scotland and all the, 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 the change that we can have. So they can do that in skills training, they can do it in co-production, uh, but they can actually do it very much by commissioning. Um, and it's the commissioning aspect we come back to time and time again. So the way to support creative industries in Scotland is to have more decision making and commissioning in Scotland because we're likely then to have more commissions in and of Scotland that we can then contribute to, to, to the UK. So I think it's absolutely critical. Is there a danger that uh, the BBC might be too dominant in the market in terms of you know, all the uh, too big a proportion of the creative industries in Scotland become dependent on the BBC? Well, in a sense, if there's more business for Scotland, that might be a nice problem to have. But um, in terms of, you're, you're absolutely right that you know we have got strong other sectors. We've got Channel Four. We've also got public service broadcasting, uh, you know, provision within Channel Four currently, certainly, and I think that's very, very important. And there's questions as to how Channel Four contributes um, to the creative industries, as well as STV. And I think, I, I think, um, in terms of, um, if you look, at, you've taken evidence from MG Alpha. I think their model of what they're doing and how they support independent producers is really, really strong. Now, there's a scalability aspect of what can be done from that for um, the rest of Scotland and indeed perhaps elsewhere. So, you know, the issue is, you know, you've got a diminishing resource. Um, we're saying that we want, you know, we think there should be more resource to Scotland to reflect our population share, etc. But even without, even without a, a, an increase in resource, transfer of decision making would have an injection of potentially you know, £80 million pounds or otherwise in terms of um, economic and creative impact. Now, that helps creative industries. Um, so you know, we're, in a, we're in a strong place. We've got um, capability, but we're, 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 we're underutilising our potential in terms of creative industries of the BBC. So you know, yes, there's got to be check, checks and balances there. Um, and that's why some of the Ofcom rules about eligibility about independent producers for the BBC themselves means you know, that, that's the movement and shift. I think the BBC Studios has potential, but it could actually, as, as you've been warned, I think, by Janet Archer and some of the evidence, if it ends up in reinforcing the centralisation of production in, uh, you know, in, the, in the London corridor M25, then you're just going to recreate with the BBC Studios problems that we already have with the BBC uh, as such. So, but I, I, I can't be definitive as to where that will be because we still haven't got definition and clarity from the BBC themselves of where they see BBC Studios in the competition. Cabinet Secretary, um, I just wondered, in the context of charter renewal, I, I just wondered whether what your view is of how the Scottish Government, in partnership with Creative Scotland, um, could propose to become engaged in the whole process of setting st the strategic, strategic direction um, of, for the development of broadcasting in Scotland and also uh, for the independent production um, in Scotland. Yeah, I mean, we've already got, in terms of, um, you've got the TV leadership group, we're also, we're thinking probably, you know, in terms of strategically, film and television are becoming so, you know, high-end high television is, you know, is competing in, in, in many regards, as, in, you know, film screen sectors um, have, uh, have done previously. So, therefore, there is more of a connection about looking about this strategy for screen in Scotland collectively. Um, there's, obviously, in terms of injection of funding, we've got development fund, production fund, different things that we as a government are providing with, and the film strategy um, you know, focus that uh, uh, Creative Scotland have, and also in relation to um, the screen uh, leadership group that's been uh, you know, established that brings in the independent producers so that the sector themselves can help set this. I, it's like any creative, it's like any sector, whether it's creative industries, energy, food and drink, um, tourism or other areas, it's not for government or government agencies themselves to set a strategy um, without... Uh, recourse to what the industry itself wants and I think we're far, getting far better placed in Scotland to make sure that all the players whether it's BBC, STV, uh, BBC Scotland, STV and indeed the independent production sector um, are coming together to help set that strategy but I don't know Laura if you can maybe want to add in what else is happening in terms of that area or if, is that sufficient for you going on? Well I mean I, if Laura I wants to. I, yeah. I think that just about I mean that covers it in terms of the, the funding and the work that we do we've also got the Scottish Creative Industries Partnership as well um, and the work that we do there. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, thank you very much. I don't think there's any more questions at the moment. Cabinet Secretary, can I thank you and your officials for coming along this morning? Again, we appreciate your time um, in coming to the committee. Um, as the committee has already agreed to take the next item in private, I close the meeting to the public.